And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one of the one of the newer good brothers here in the temple. <laughs> the the man who pro the man who probably hates Colt Cabana more than it more than anyone else here in the temple. <laughs> good brother Mace. <laughs> Yes, I saw the bar light was on, and I figured I'd walk in and see what happens. Yeah, um, I would. It's one. It's one of those. It's one of those cases where we have to we have to keep the bar open more than other bars because we have to deal with time zones. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and I'm not. I'm not going to have everybody, everybody curtailed to my time zone. That would be asking way too much. Even well, especially you know. especially when your time zone comes in the middle of when I get paid to work. Yeah. So those who those who pay get the first dibs. Mm -hmm. And there, well, there's all there's also the fact that even my own countrymen tend to ignore my tend to ignore the um to, at least half of the time zones in North America. Yeah, um, but that's North America. We don't care about them. <laughs> oh. <Come on>. um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep that in mind the next time. The next time I see, next time I see a bunch of people in warm climates panicking over an inch of snow. Yeah. Again, I, I, I don't have to deal with that. I'm in the southern hemisphere where it's nice and warm, and the most we get is rain. Yeah, I um, whenever, I always, I always, I always laugh when some of my when some of my southern friends come up here, come up here, and they end up getting that blast of cold air. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just sitting, and then they go back and bundle up. I'm just sitting. I'm just sitting back in my regular clothes. Like, what? You guys cold? Yeah. Well, you know, some people don't have the uh, the gumption for that type of thing. And hey, that's just them. Me, I I walk around in shorts and snow, so I'm good. Well, I'd. Well, you um. Oh, we both we both have to deal with different. We both have to. I was gonna say we both have to deal with different kinds of bullshit, whether it be weather or roads. Looking at you. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I had this nice little meme image around. If you can find it, uh, the different between difference Melbourne between. And Sydney. Yep, between Melbourne and Sydney. I I'm in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Well, at the outer suburbs of Melbourne, and it's like yes, Melbourne because we like you, and Sydney because fuck you. The way I the way I first saw it is Melbourne wants you wants you to know exactly where you where you are and where you need to go. Sydney, mm -hmm. fuck you. Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> and, and and also road rules do not exist in Sydney, as I found out taking a, a a taxi back from a wedding that I attended a few years back up there. That, that, I, that scared the crap out of me. Mm -hmm. Now, I originally originally I was going to have you on for the third part of the Exodus trilogy migrating from Azeroth to Hydaelyn. Um, yes. But obvious, obviously IRL things got in the way and um, so this so this is a bit of a catch up and just a one to one on that matter. So I'd like to start at the humble beginnings. Um, did you did you start out with with World of Warcraft in in vanilla or did you start during one of the expansions? I started very late in vanilla. Uh, I can't remember exactly when it, like how far into it we were. I think it was about the time we got. Um... Oh, now this is where it's going to start pushing my knowledge straight away. Um, because I, I honestly I haven't played World of Warcraft in over a year. Uh, that's how long it's been for my Exodus. Mm -hmm. But um, the. Where you take on Kalthasad? Yeah, um, that, that'd be that'd be a bit of, a bit in the tail end. Were you okay? Look, I can I can nail it down by this. Were you there for the blood plague incident? No, I was not. Oh, actually, blood plague would be Alhaka. That would have been during BC. No, blood I don't know. Temple, te Temple of Alcaha. Uh, uh, yeah. No, I was I was after that, but I did hear about that uh, many years later, and I also heard about the Ranf Ranf uh, 
ramifications. We love those nice little long words here. Mm-hmm. Uh, where a uh, viral uh, study is sort of virologists or whatever they want to call themselves. Epidemiologists. That's, that's the one. I knew it had a science, science-y word in there somewhere. Basically uh, looked at that as the way a plague could spe- spread throughout a mass population mm-hmm. and actually actually became the baseline for a lot of the COVID research that we see today. Yeah. Um, I think it was... I think... It, well, it provided the it provided the ideal... Ex, provided the ideal... Um, experiment with a control because of the large sample size you have with millions of um, players with WoW. Um, yes, and, and also see how sh- people want to be trolls and be stupid. Yeah. At the... At the now, um... Uh, uh, you... during, during the next ra- next Ramus patch yep. was where I came in, so... Ah. Were you familiar... Were you, um... Was World of Warcraft your first introduction to Warcraft, or were you familiar with the um, R- were you familiar with the RTSs before then? I was familiar with the RTSs. I hadn't played Warcraft or Warcraft Two as extensively as a lot of Blizzard flan- fans had. Uh, I did play Warcraft Three and the Thro- the Frozen Throne mm-hmm. uh, quite often on my PC through Yo Ho Yo Hos, but. Um, because at that point I was a very poor, poor mm-hmm. high school student, yeah. or even earlier back then. Jeez, but I had had experience with other MS- MMOs as well. I did play a little bit of EverQuest mm-hmm. back in back in the day, so it was not my first foray into the MMO genre, but it was my first real real foray into the extensive lore that would become the World of Warcraft universe. Yeah. Um. Now, when it comes now, given given that, um, it's it is funny you bring up EverQuest because one of the er, one of the early design ethos they ha- they had um, was ta- was taking a lot of concepts with EverQuest and trying to I'd say simplify, but that ha- but that has a bit of a connotation, um, but make make it um, try and trim the unnecessary fat. I guess is the way way I put it, and that's yeah. that's something that's been fairly co- that was fairly common during Blizzard's heyday of taking taking established genres and trying to make them more approachable. Yeah, it was more marketable than anything else because EverQuest back in its day was that uh, stereotypical neckbeard uh, gamer who who would be staying either in their mother's basement or, in the case of me, actually playing was. One of my <laughs> my mother's, uh, well, one of her dates for a while. He actually shared a house with uh, two or three other people, and all they would do is sit around and play things like EverQuest and and do stuff like that. So that's where I got my first taste of it. I'd but say the, I'd but, say but, the... But, but, but yeah, World of Warcraft was basically trying to take the very established MMORPG genre that you would have seen in things like like EverQuest and uh, RuneScape, which was also another one around the time, mm-hmm. and sim- simplify it down to appeal to a mass audience. Yeah. Um, and incident- incidentally, I had, le- I had learned a few years ago that even trying to get the game off the ground was a fight. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I've I've heard the same thing, uh, but yeah, it was one of those things that mm-hmm. you know you take a very established group like the Blizzard Company at the time, and they they were more used to working on the well sort of I, I call it tabletop RPG style that that three quarter looking down, but that's that RTS was, they face. Um, the AR the the ARPG end of things that was a that was Blizzard North that was a di- that was a different department altogether. Um, but the but when when it came to uh, but I, I see where you're going when it came to the when it came to the RTS stuff. Um, mm. and yeah yeah there were yeah there had been flirtations with with console but that on, but that only happened like three times and 
all th- and all three of them didn't really stick. And yet, they've become cult classics ever since. You know, give give me give me more rock and roll racing. Oh, uh, g- give me the the, the the dwarves, the Lost Vikings, yeah. the Lost Vikings. Yes, I want more Lost Vikings and and rock and roll racing in my life. So, mm-hmm. yeah, Blizzard, please more. Oh. <laughs> then again, then again, I I've I had asked for more. I had asked for more full throttle for years. So, oh yes, me, I suppose. Um. See that's where I got I got a bit mixed up. Full throttle, I always thought was uh, was a LucasArts title, uh, which is which is understandable given around mm. that time LucasArts was basically blazing a trail when it came to point and click adventure games. Yes, uh, but getting back to getting back to WoW, um, I had mentioned this on Sunday, but. One little problem that I did that I did that I did start to notice early on was the discrepancy between uh, multi-role classes and specs versus single-role classes and specs. Mm-hmm. I.e., the um, le- the former becoming could become a little bit too useful. Yeah, but that's always been the the thing with uh, especially World of Warcraft in this particular. Sense, or even their RTS games to a degree, is that their balancing styles between the, the different roles and play styles has never been one of pure balance. There's always been one that's always going to be bigger over the, over the other. You know, to take it out of the World of Warcraft context, uh, with StarCraft, hmm. how many people prefer playing Zerg? Because they're, they're the quick swarm race that goes over and you can just fill the map in instance. Yeah. Oh. You know, that, that, that's, that, that's again, that's Blizzard always will have a proclivity to focus on one thing over the other, but not let, never look at the entire picture at once. Mm-hmm. And that, that was prevalent through just about every one of their games. Uh, Diablo two was the same. Uh, even Diablo one, Diablo three, definitely. But yeah, over the years, it just seems that they, they just stopped really caring about balancing what they're doing and just focus on what is the most OP thing right now. And if people are yelling about it, we squash it. I, I really started to notice that with, um, with Overwatch, but that's a, that's a story. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a whole different story there, yes. Now, yeah. I, would li- I would like to... In order, in order to kind of get, in order to kind of get into the, get into where the migration ended up happening, um, away, away from WoW, um, I feel like, I feel like we'd have, I feel like we'd have to kind of go through the diff, the different exp, the different expansions and kind of get, and kind of get where your head was at with, with each one, um, chronologically. Mm-hmm. Um, and since you mentioned that you that um you had that you had quit that you haven't played for about a year. That does that does allow us for a bigger sample size than um, what I got on Sunday. Okay, I mean, I'm sure you had a lot of people who left during probably either Warlords of Draenor, Legion, or Battlefire Azeroth. Um, it was it was all over the place. Uh-huh. Which, as a wannabe scientist, certainly help certainly helps me because it means that. I can look. I can look at the different the different parts and what uh, made what made somebody leave. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd like to start with Burning Crusade. Okay, which, Bur- Burning Crusade, which tends to be pr- tends to be looked on pretty fondly. I don't know why, because looking back on that, that was the most bland and boring expansion I'd ever seen. I, I don't know why with this uh, World, of Warcraft, World of Warcraft classic campaign that they're doing that uh, so many people bought into the Burning Crusade hype when really the, the lands that were presented to us were very barren, very minimalistic, didn't really have a wow factor. And I, I really... If I could, anytime I was leveling, if I f- could find a way to skip that expansion, I would. 
You weren't, you I, weren't a fan of Outland, I take it? No, I, I wasn't. It was one of those things where I, I can still remember going to the, the midnight release of it, and that was great because that was the first time I ever got sort of really in-depth with the, the actual community here in Australia, mm-hmm. was standing in line waiting to buy that game at midnight and then taking it home, only to realize that even after I installed all five CDs worth, I still had to download a patch afterwards, and I just went, cool, it's now close to 2 o'clock in the morning, and I still haven't installed this, screw this, I'm going to bed. But when I started playing it, I just found that going from the the look of Vanilla WoW, which you had mostly Azeroth to work with, you had that very medieval look to it. You had nice uh, forest areas, you had you had a couple of desert areas, which are fine, but you didn't spend much time in those. You would have a lot of areas where it was very dense and it felt very populated. It felt the world was a, a bit of a, li- a living creature in itself. You wanted then, biome varieties. Is that where I'm getting... Is that where you're going with that? If I'm going to be spending many hours running around doing quests, I want at least to have something decent to look at. Mm-hmm. You, like, you go from all the these forests and swamps and everything with amazing textures and you know, great layouts to this big flat land of nothing. Mm-hmm. And when you're running around that for many, for at least the first, I think the three, first three levels, mm-hmm. oh my god, did it get boring. Yeah. Um, did you, now before I get, before I get it, before I get further into it, did, um, were you, were you mainly, P, were you mainly PVE or did you do some PVP and did some, did some raiding? Uh, I didn't really get into either like raiding or PvP until uh, the next one, which was Wrath of the Lich King. Mm-hmm. I dabbled a little bit during BC, but it wasn't my main thing. I was mainly PvE, going in, doing quests and um, crafting gear and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Sort of working work the economy at that particular point in time. Mm-hmm. So I... Really just was not a fan. Like, I tried PvP a few times, just wasn't a fan of it. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to get into a guild that was at raiding level ever during that expansion. And I never got a chance to do many of the raids until I could solo them much later. That make that makes sense. Mm. Um, so let, so let's, let's talk about Wrath of the Lich King, which... Um, a lot of people consider Wrath of the Lich King the peak. Yes, I would be one of them. I'd say, I'd say, one, I'd say one major part of that is the fact that um, somebody like Arthas is a design is a design and a just a general vibe that you're not going to forget. It's mm-hmm. going to be it's going to be one of those that sticks in your head. Um, I've seen some argue that Arthas is a poor, is a poor man's Elric, but. Only the snobbish people um, take that route, and if you really want to go down that rabbit hole, I could we could go we could go down the rip we could go down the ripping off or taking inspiration rabbit hole for like two years straight. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, especially especially given how um, Games Workshop tried to start tried to stop Warcraft from even happening with, back with the original orcs and goblins, but that's because work um, Games Workshop is run by a bunch of cunts. Yeah. Yeah, that one I can definitely agree with. <laughs> um, it's not the first time that they did that they did this because they, I think they tried to get, I think they tried again with Star, with StarCraft and it went nowhere. Because yeah, because because they believed Zerg and one of their uh, one of their races were too closely designed and all that crap. Yeah, um, but the, the, like the, nobody owns the the whole uh, you know goblins and. Orcs and stuff like that. Well, that's reason, been that, reason, that's been staple of medieval fantasy for decades. It's the reason Games Workshop puts in their orcs with a K because they tr- when they they tried to trademark orc when they were putting out the Lord of the the Lord of the Rings strategy battle game. Mm. But ov- obviously, obviously the obviously the off the powers that be said fuck off. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because there's a. 
I, now, I can only speak on U.S. law on, the, on this regard, but there is a concept called genericide. Um, so, i.e., i.e., something that's something a term that's so widespread that it's hard it's hard to trace a point of origin. Now, obvious, obviously, there's pre there's precedent when it comes to mythological figures, which orc is going to is going to fall under. Yes. Much in the same way that you could make a you could make a Thor comic. You just can't have blonde. You just can't have a blonde Thor. Yeah, because of the design being trademarked by Marvel Comics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when it came when it came to when it came to when it came to Wrath, I remember I remember a lot of people really not liking um, Death Knights early on, especially in PvP. Yes, the introduction of the hero class and the very notorious. Uh, we're going to make something that is so great and overpowered in the beginning that it is going to dominate the landscape idea that Blizzard would follow through for quite a few times in the future. Yeah. Um, the big... Because of how... Because of how have, when when um, Death Knights... Were, with In hindsight, with the way Death Knights were advertised and presented... Now, it, cer it, certainly, made, it certainly made sense, and the fantasy is going to be appealing, especially given... Um, the especially given the use of Death Knights during the Frozen Throne expansion for Warcraft Three, mm -hmm. but I'm remind uh, as a this will be a bit this will be a bit of a side tangent. But did you ever play Star Wars Galaxies? <laughs> Sorry, is Adam Cole interrupts us? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Star Wars Galaxies. That was the <sighs> keep off. Uh, edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Star Wars Galaxies. That wasn't the MMO one, was it? That was the RTS online RTS version. No, um, that was Galaxy. I, 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 think, I think I have. Uh, You're yeah, thinking Galaxy. of Galaxy at War. That Galaxy at War was the RTS. Galaxies was the was the um, sandbox MMO that was published by SOE. Um, oh, now you're stressing. Now you're stressing. I'm gonna have to actually Google that because <laughs> I, I I played an MMO. <laughs> I remember that much. But the reason I the reason I want the reason I bring that up, the reason I bring that up is um, Ralph Coster, who was the lead developer for it, for the longest time was insistent on not putting. In Jedi as a as a playable build, and his reason uh, for that was that Jedi would become an alpha class that everybody would want to do. Which which happened many years later when they did the the old Republic. Um, it also it also happened in the tail end of Galaxies with the with the new game experience era, and he tried he tried to make it. Difficult to do it, where you had to be both force sensitive and collect um, holocrons that were all over the map. But once people figured out where the spawn points of the holocrons were, that was kind that became kind of moot. Um, and it did, and he was, and he was right. It did become an alpha class. Um, so There's always going in something like that type of design where you are using a very highly known and highly established IP. Of course, when you add something like Jedi to, as a playable class, everybody's going to want to be a Jedi. Yeah. Because that, that, that was the fantasy that you grew up seeing on the screen. You know, when you don't have the uh, sort of the, the more variety level stuff that we have now with stuff like The Mandalorian and the uh, upcoming uh, Book of Boba Fett, hmm. which really puts the bounty hunter class into perspective. You know, if you had that stuff back then, then there'd be more people inclined to play other classes. But because a lot of people grew up watching the Jedi, that's obviously where you want to put yourself as a I was as gonna, a player. I was going to bring up Kyle Katarn, but um, he ends up become he ends up becoming a Jedi essentially, anyways. So that's <laughs> so that's kind of moot. Even though um, Dark Forces is a lot better than than people think. A lot of people write it off as just Doom Star Wars. 
Dark Forces is a highly underrated game, especially in the modern age. Yeah. Um, it's, se it's sequel I'm a little less fond of, but that's be but <laughs> but I would I would pay good I would pay good money for a source port of Dark Forces just so I don't have to use DOSBox. Yeah. Uh, but when it comes but when it comes to the when it comes to how heavily advertised the Death Knight class was, um, you end up you that's what you end up with that same alpha class kind of kind of mindset, mm. especially given how especially given how powerful certain spe certain specs could get. Um, True, so but but the the other thing with the Death Knights though is. It was the first time that World of Warcraft, or even Warcraft in general, had worked on a very specific and new hero class for the game. So you had you had that intrigue. You know, this was the big the big point. One of the bigger points of the expansion was that you could unlock the de unlock the Death Knight class once you hit level seventy, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. and that just gave you a whole new character to play with. By by the time Wrath come out, a lot of people would have had, you know, on average about four to five alts of all different classes to, to play with. So to have this brand new character class come out, of course everybody's going to want to play it and try it. Yeah. I was one of them, and I played it for all five minutes and went, nah, can't be bothered by. Well, what what turned you off when it, when it came to Death Knights? Uh, I think a lot of it was the fact that, like, it had a great story beginning. Like, that first bit where you go from from Nax Ramas to taking on this, this big uh, battle at Light's Hope Chapel. And then from there, you're going into, you know, either uh, Stormwind or Ironforge, where you're literally having rotten fruit and everything put thrown at you, all of a sudden they go, this person belongs to the Horde slash Alliance and they are welcome within our ranks. Okay, because of the level that you're at, off you go to Hellfire Peninsula and do BC again. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was just so over BC. Uh, my playtime in BC, I was able to, I mostly was playing a Hunter at the time. But I had also leveled a mage and a paladin, so to go from playing a paladin to playing a death knight wasn't that much of a difference. So I just didn't see the the reasoning behind it. Plus the mechanics, this whole runes thing and the the different uh, what are they what are they called? Like you had un undead frost and blood. something blood. Where you, you had them tied into your spell attacks, I just couldn't get the rotations down, and it, it's got frustrating to me. Like, I couldn't get grasp of my mind around the mechanic until many years later. Mm -hmm. But that that was a lot of what turned me off in in terms of playing that that type of character. But when it comes to Wrathful Lich King as a whole, I I've sort of had this theory where the success of an expansion is going to lie in the story, the lore, and the villain. Because in BC, you had Illidan and Stormrage. The problem was, a lot of people outside of seeing him in Warcraft 3 getting the skull of Gul'dan and becoming a demon after being a demon hunter as a, as a night elf... He didn't have much of a story. Mm -hmm. Where, whereas you then had going in the wrath, you had the story of um, War the Warcraft Three expansion, the the Frozen Throne, where it was all about Arthas. Mm -hmm. You got to connect with Arthas. You got to see his corruption happen. You got to see him wipe out an entire village when he got a hold of Frostmourne. You saw all the events leading up to him becoming the Lich King, and now you're in a story expansion where his power has grown so much that he has taken over the whole of Northrend, essentially. 
and you know that the last fight you're going to get in this expansion is going to be the Lich King. Mm-hmm. And all the story beats, and a, a lot of it comes from, I reckon, story-wise, Wrath was the best and best laid out planned story. And that's what drew you in. Because you always had an interaction with the Lich King all the way through the game. Because he was trying to corrupt you throughout all of this. Mm-hmm. So when you got to that final battle where you finally get to Ice Crown, you got to take him on. You feel like you've earned that fight. Whereas going back to BC, you didn't really hear much about um, Illidan Stormrage being the, the, the guy behind it all. He really just wasn't there for a majority of it. Mm-hmm. You, you were dealing with all these other groups, factions and everything else. Then all of a sudden you get funneled into this last area where you went to the Black Temple and you fight against him. Yay. There's no real build-up. Where, whereas, again, Wrath of the Lich King, you are not only working off established law with Warcraft 3, but you're expanding upon it. You're really getting into the nitty-gritty of some of... Like, in... in uh, I think it was patch. It was where they in- introduced uh, Call of the Crusade, so three point two. Mm-hmm. There was a storyline that went on in that particular area where you got to see things like the fight once again between the Illidan and Arthas, but you got to see it from Arthas's pr- perspective. Whereas earlier, you if you went in vanilla, you actually got to see it from uh, Illidan's perspective. So you got to see the same fight in two different ways. But you got to hear more about Frostmourne and the corrupted influences. And you got to, again, you got to relate more to a villain which who did these big villainous things. And then you get the big call of, okay, we're going to go and basically beat his ass. Mm-hmm. And that's, it. again, storytelling in an MMO is paramount to the enjoyability of the experience. And if you don't have a good villain, then you're not going to have a good story, and you're not going to have a good experience. Yeah. Now, with a lo- with a lot of the story beats, we'll get we'll get to those. We'll get to certain specific ones at, as we as we go in because I wanted I want to tackle um the, I want to tackle the lore issue over the years mm-hmm. in a um di- in a different part of this. Okay. But, um, the next one, the next one is Cataclysm, and for one, for one of our colleagues, um, Cataclysm is where he quit. And okay. for, for me, um, I cer- I certainly had my issues with um, with Cataclysm because it, ve- it very much felt like Cataclysm very much felt like to me a shock moment. Like we don't we don't know how we don't know how we can top um, the appearance of Arthas, so let's let's try and do this massive world reset. With, and the bit, but doing the, doing that is 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 not a problem in and of itself. But it comes down, but for me, it came down to execution because I don't think because up until that point, I think there was barely any mention of Deathwing. Uh, not well. Yes and no. Um, I'm not. Ca- I'm not counting novels or or stuff. No, like no. This is the, this was before the big novel inflation, um, and that, that's another thing that I'll I'd love to talk, touch on later. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was mentioned. I think there were some mentions of him in vanilla, but they're only like he pop up in quest text or. There'd be a mention of the character somewhere during a bit of dialogue. Blink and you miss he, it. He, yeah, a lot of blink and you miss it stuff. He was never one of these characters that was designed to be a big heavy hitter in any of that. And I so. even even in the patches leading up to that, I don't re- I don't recall him being teased at all. No, no. Uh, there, there was so, again. It was one of those things. I think it like he relates because of the Anixia storylines, 
because they are technically brother and sister. Mm-hmm. And there were, I think you'd have to go back to probably Warcraft or Warcraft 2 lore in order to find any mention of Deathwing pre-World Warcraft. Yeah, the the point the point is is that I'd say for the I'd say for a large chunk of the user base for World of Warcraft um they would they would have had no they um would have had very little if any foreknowledge about um Deathwing or even just just as a whole. Well there was always there was always rumors of a dragon that the dwarves had kept captive. But again, it's blink and you miss it type stuff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was a that was one of those weird ones. To to sort of, again, it was like we don't know exactly what to do, but we're going to do something big. And I, I'm going back, and I'm sort of looking at the timelines. Uh, this during this particular time, uh, you would have. Fa- Patch 4.0, which was the, or 4.0.1, October 12th, 2010, which was the beginning of Cataclysm. If you go and actually have a look at timelines, only a couple of weeks before, Final Fantasy XIV had actually launched. That's yeah, September, September yeah, 30, 2010. Yeah, so that's, see, one, yeah. that's 1.0. 1. 1. Mm-hmm. And we've, I've, talk, I've talked over how... Um, Leg- Legacy FF was uh, was a hot mess. In fact, there's that whole um, there's that whole documentary about about the Realm Reborn that t- that touches on how much of, how much of a disaster behind the scenes it was. Um, yeah, but I I never just for the record I never actually played 1.0. I did. I I, I had no interest <laughs> in it whatsoever. I was so deep in World of Warcraft at this point that I didn't even realize that it was a thing. Yeah, I um I did. And I can vouch for the fact that it was that it was a mess. Um, there were certain there were certain narrative thing certain narrative things that I liked, but the problem was it was it was trying it was trying to be ele- it was trying to be eleven two. In 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 an age when eleven two wasn't gonna fly, eleven was still was still in that sandboxy a- age a la ga- a la galaxies EverQuest and RuneScape, but. Mm. After 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 um after World of Warcraft basically became the standard, um you couldn't really you can't really do that sandbox style in in the same way anymore. Of course, it did it doesn't exactly help that they didn't br- they didn't bring in any any uh, a lot of the staff for um fourteen Legacy were not had had very little experience when it came to developing MMOs, and when Yoshi P took over, he was shocked at how little MMO experience the team had. They were most they were mostly people who had worked on the single player games in the franchise. Yeah. See I, I was more of a of, again, I was one of those people who would play the single player RPGs for Final Fantasy at that time. I had no interest in eleven. I think a lot of that also had to do with the fact that we were still running I think cable at the time was still very expensive, and it was something where we had extremely limited um, download speeds or download data caps here in Australia. Mm-hmm. So, play, so playing a game like that was near impossible. Yeah, I always, I always look at a game like Eleven and say this was this was built for the net cafes. I, yes, net cafes aren't um, even but even at that time, even in um, two thousand eight, weren't weren't as weren't as weren't really a thing in the states, and I, I doubt that I doubt that there was a whole that there was a huge net cafe cu- culture in Australia the same way there is so in parts of Asia, in parts of Asia. Surprisingly enough, we did actually have a big net cafe culture here, mainly because of our proximity to Asian nations such as Japan and China. Um, a lot of them were uh, Chinese owned and operated. But they were also some of the ones that were in areas where they could have, I uh, don't know if you remember the old T1 business lines back mm-hmm. in the day. 
you know, they, they were able to have that type of bandwidth available, which was a lot more than what we had in the ha in the homes. But, um, again, that didn't really sort of come along until, until about Wrath. I, I do remember spending many days with friends of mine playing uh, stuff in Wrath in the net cafes just mm -hmm. because we had nothing else to do with our days. <laughs> Yeah, walk, walk in with the place open, drop down for a day pass, and that was our day until, like, the doors closed. Mm -hmm. Now, that brings me to... Uh, now, when it, came, when it came to Cataclysm, I remember I remember that you mentioning you mentioning you were not fond of Outland because, because of the lack of variety when it came to biomes. So I'm guessing mm -hmm. you... I'm guessing you were not all that fond of, of a lot of the environments in Cataclysm. Uh, actually, quite the opposite. Uh, when it came to Cataclysm, because it was going back on familiar territory that had been altered due to the events of, of Deathwing's Awakening and him, you know, going all over the place and, you know, setting things on fire or com in terms of some of the biomes uh, just completely upending what they were, it made for a fresh experience. Even though I was retreading old ground, it was old ground, but in a new new way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So once where there was massive deserts, there was areas that had become gigantic lakes. You know, in in areas where there were forests, is now smoldering ash. Uh, in the terms of where he actually came out, and you got Deathwing Scar. I actually found that particular quest was some, one of the most hilarious things that I'd ever played because it, it decided at that point, they had a good idea on how to tell a story mm -hmm. and at the same time, still have things light. And I don't mean like their last couple of expansions where they've like, <laughs> we're going to make you pick up poo. No, no, this was like, like that, that scar of Deathwing you have the three guys who are telling the story of Deathwing's Awakening from three completely over-exaggerated perspectives, mm -hmm. including the dwarf, who, who, whose whole thing was, I want to punch Deathwing in the face. Mm -hmm. And that I found absolutely hilarious. Yeah. And it was at, at a time, like, I started getting... By the time I got to the end of BC and going into Wrath, I had started raiding. I had started PvP. So to go from such very stringent and straightforward tactics to being able to go into an expansion where there was a little bit of fun, there was a little bit of... But there was also that danger there at all times because in a lot of the early patches, you still had Deathwing flying through a lot of the areas in uh, Cataclysm coming and setting things on fire. So you had that constant dread of... If you heard Deathwing coming, you might want to get inside a building or you might want to log out mm. because he'll come back and burn your butt. Whereas, yeah, it was just... I, I quite enjoyed that. And a lot of it also because of there was some content in there where it was stuff that I sort of missed the first time around because, I, be, again, being a vanilla... Uh, coming in late in vanilla... I never got to do uh, Molten Core properly. Mm -hmm. So I so this was my first time getting to see the legendary Ragnaros Lord of Fire uh, for the first time in a raid encounter. And then to find out when you do Heroic, he has legs, was hilarious. <laughs> but, like, again, it was... A lot of that, again, comes from doing things that I never thought I could... I could do, you know, uh, Zulaman, Zulagrub, uh, Zulgrub, mm -hmm. again, because they, were, because they went to becoming uh, five-man dungeons rather than raids, I was able to do them. Mm -hmm. And then you had the, uh, like, the Dragon Soul raids and stuff like that, which I thought were actually very well done in terms of mechanics, and, you know, I was able to actually start raiding properly during that time. Mm -hmm. But... <laughs> Again, this uh, like I think there was a lot. A lot of it came from also. This was the point where 
uh, Blizzard had started taking a more interest in casual play rather than just catering everything to the hardcore high-end raiders as they would do in later expansions. Mm-hmm. This is where you got things like you got your group finder, you got your your raid finder. Um, heroics started being a thing. Mm-hmm. And, and there was more accessibility. Like there was also uh, reforging and stuff like that. There was a lot of stuff in there that made it made everything more accessible to players. Especially players like myself who would find, you know, they might not be able to get into a guild that would be at the right level of rating or they'd just be so far up their own asses that you really just didn't want to do anything with them. Mm-hmm. There were alternatives coming through. So, you know, I, could, I didn't have to be a part of a, a guild to go and raid Dragon's Hole. I could just use Raid Finder. Mm-hmm. And that would be enough to satisfy my play style because my play style has always been about the story and about the enjoyability and learning more about the lore than it has been, you know, hardcore progression. So in in terms of a, a gameplay and accessibility, uh, Cataclysm was probably one of the better, like, well, Wrath of Lich King will always be my top expansion. Cataclysm would probably be my number two just by the accessibility of gameplay alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now, when it can, now, um, Mists of Pandaria is where is from what I recall was where was where there was a where we started to see a degree of device of divisiveness, um, but I remember I remember watching Bellular's documentary on it and he called it a bit of an underdog story because it started out rough as hell, but down the but down the road in the in its run, uh, Mists of Pandaria got got ended up getting better. Mm. Yes and no. Like again, just going from my own perspective, like um, you know, no disrespect to Bayor, I watch a lot of his stuff. Very well informed, really yeah, good minded dude. I'm only bring I'm only bringing up Bellular because in preparation for doing this, I ended up doing a bunch of research with watching a bunch of videos all over the place to. Kind and of to, kind of... to, to to be honest, if you're looking for that type of thing, he is the go to guy for that. I will admit. Um, but again, from somebody who was there and experienced it from the get-go, uh, I don't see what why people had such a problem with Mr. Pandora. Like, I know the whole pandas thing was, you know, it was a, it was a joke in Warcraft 3. And people thought it was all... And, treated it as an April Fool's joke, and it was an April Fool's joke. It, uh, early on, I think it was back during Vanilla, Blizzard actually tweeted out as one of their April Fool's jokes, well, not so much tweeted out, but put out as a part of their jokes that they were going to add the pandas into World of Warcraft, and it got a laugh. But then when they did a whole expansion around it, I think this is where the fan base just sort of went, oh, it's too childish. But when you look at the, again, you're going back, look at the lore, look at the story that they told, the balance between light and dark, the the very zen balanced nature of the universe and, and everything in it. And then you have, you know, a character such as uh, Garrosh, who was starting to come up as a major villain at this particular point in time. You know, basically becoming the epitome of the darkness and everything. It was one hell of a story. It was, it was again a really good storytelling. But I think because everybody got so bogged down in the fact of, oh my god, we have pandas now. So what? I do. Remember. Yeah, it, it was. It was actually and. and to be honest, it was the introduction of what has become what became one of my uh, more amusing classes at the time, which was the monk class. Now, obviously, I ended up playing a fair bit of monk because, well, it's <laughs> obviously, yeah, gotta, <laughs> you got to live the gimmick. <laughs> yeah, I I got to work my gimmick. Um, but I will admit one th- one thing, one um change that I did that I did 
I did start to see, and I can't remember if this was started in Cataclysm or started in Pandaria, or started in Pandaria, was the radical overhaul that was done to the talent trees. Oh, I think that might have been Cataclysm. Yeah, I um, I under I understand the reason why it was done. Um, it very it very much in in some ways it was kind of reminiscent to the to the talent setup that was used in Diablo three. At the same time, there's a part of me that all that always has a bit of a sour taste in my mouth over the over the overhaul of talent trees. Because it meant because it meant a um, bottlenecking of build variety. Yes, and, and, and an overemphasis on 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 having on having individual specs more or less play the same. I guess is the way I'd put it. Which it it, it, it became the and it was removed in Cataclysm. I just did a quick Google. Mm -hmm. Um. The removal of talent trees when it came to cat Cataclysm, it wasn't so much everything plays the same. It was the beginning of that min-max requirement. I, th I think it, it had gone from, instead of, like, min-max requirement's always been a part of World of Warcraft. It's been there since vanilla. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it's you, you had a bit more variety. This was meant to be a streamline, which just became an absolute mess of stuff that didn't work in relation to all specs. It it made one spec superior over the other. It sort of did more to define class roles than anything else Blizzard had done. So, like, you, if you were playing, a, if you were playing a healer. You had to play what was the best healer at the time, which go going back to Pandaria. But, uh, I think it would have been priests were still pretty high up there with Mistweaver monks becoming second. But like you, you were sort of forced if you were playing a monk, then you'd be looking at you would either be a tank or you would be a healer. Because that's what they were better at at the time. Mm -hmm. If you're playing a Death Knight, then you're definitely playing a tank. If you're playing a Paladin, you're playing a, a tank or you're playing DPS. It was starting to take away the... Uh, God, it was a great way that it was described the other day. That I can't remember off the top of my head. It was taking... It was sort of... Taking the personality out of the, the classes and just streamlining it to just be a numbers game. Yeah, and I know whenever I whenever I bring this kind of thing up, I've I've had I've had some stand say but but that um F, that FF14's class design it is is just as streamlined and I don't have a problem with that. This is one of those cases where where be, where um where being being true in the pedantic in the most pedantic of senses doesn't doesn't take into account the full context, and I think I mentioned this on Sunday. But the re the big reason why I do why I don't have as much of an issue in regard in regards to the in regards to how linear the class design might be in FF14 is that it is is that is that so much of it is built around that degree of linearity, and if you mm. and to the point that. They even tried to they even tried to make A and B versions of each class and it kept and it was creating more problems than it solved, so they scrapped it. Um, yeah. I remember you you, 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 ha you have more defined class roles in Final Fantasy fourteen than you do in World of Warcraft. Like if you're going if you want to be a, a melee a big melee DPS, then you go play Marauder. If you want to be a tank, you play a paladin. Mm -hmm. If you want to, you know, shoot stuff from afar, you go and play either a bard or you play a mage. Mm -hmm. You want you want to heal, then you go and play a, a white mage. Yeah, um, like it is. It is. It is. You don't have 
I'm playing a white mage, but I'm playing a DPS white mage. Mm-hmm. Every every class role is defined as a certain type of job. Yeah, it has a specific role that it slots into, and that's the role it's going to be. Whereas World of Warcraft went to try and do a every class can do everything, and it didn't work. And then when they tried to restreamline that, they botched it up even further. I'd say I'd say the lesson is the pendulum swings both ways. Yes. And, Oddly enough, this this is why I say this is why I say that despite people saying that D and D fourth edition feels like an MMO, I'd argue fifth edition f- feels more like an M- feels more like MMO design in that regard. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um. But the the one fe- the one feature that I that I'd noticed that even people even people who don't like um, Pandaria begrudgingly ed- begrudgingly enjoyed. Was the expeditions? Expeditions. Um, the the island expeditions. Oh, uh, yes the the three man the three man group runs the scenarios. Yes. Uh, again, I I'm not too sure why. I actually found those to be like if you need to come if you want to come in and run a, a quick thing, then they were the the good thing to do. Um, you know, but then again, this was a, a part of the time where everybody was more fixated, and this was the start. Well, the start of the uh, item level upgrade, where you would upgrade your items, or you you would be you you the, the big focus on heroic and mythic started coming in around this time. And that's where your hardcore started becoming more vocal. They didn't like Raid Finder. They didn't like scenarios. They didn't like anything that the casual player could do. They they wanted to start gatekeeping the game to the extent that if you weren't Mythic Raiding or you weren't PvPing it on Arena or something like that, then you were a, a below unneeded you 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 were you were nothing this is when the the toxicity of the community started to grow and that when one group becomes louder than another that's what the developers are going to start listening to squeaky wheel gets the grease yes so a lot of people like myself who were content to raid find or you know, use group finder or do expeditions or, or scenarios or whatever in order to get our gear in order to progress ourselves into the hardcore things because we didn't have friends that were going to drag us along like a lot of the guilds did at the time. You know, we were the ones that were left in the dust. Mm-hmm. And that's where you start seeing the big decline is because when you start catering to the, the loudest people in the room, you're going to find that the majority of the people that you're ignoring are the majority that are going to try and be the most loyal to you in the end. Yeah. Now, that, of course, brings us to WAD, which um, everybody and their mother and their, ba- and their mother's baby's mama um, Says says is the says is the worst expansion to the point that Blizzard publicly apologized um, about it. Um, mm-hmm. What 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 was what was your take on WAD at the, at the time? I wasn't a fan originally. Um, when I first played it, I didn't like it because it became again a very de- divisive story point for the community. And this was the beginning of, you could see, this is where Blizzard stopped paying attention to the game and started wanting to do everything else. You know, take into account at this time that this was around about when you they would have started development on the Warcraft movie. So remember, there was a tie-in for the movie at some point during Warlords. Yeah, and <laughs> the movie wasn't all. Um, I know. I know that that movie had been in development hell for years, but 
to be quite honest, the moment had passed to try and do a Warcraft movie. Yeah, because everybody was into World of Warcraft at that point. If you were, if you had done it, I don't know, maybe ten or so years earlier, when World of Warcraft was either starting and used it as a a marketing platform to get people into World of Warcraft, mm -hmm. then yeah, it would have worked a lot better. Oh, but again, but again, the technology would be nowhere near what they had for that movie. And I'll be honest, I'm one of the few people who actually enjoy the movie for what it is. I it is a, I, it is a decent retelling of the original Warcraft invasion. I enjoy, I enjoy it, but the but um the reason it the main reason that it took so long is because nobody could agree on who was getting coffee. Yes. And it, it ended up going through like ended up going through half a dozen rewrites, which is always. Always a troubling sign when that happens. Yeah, be, yeah, because at the time you had to take... Um, oh, who was the main story writer at that point? Oh. Uh, uh, there... I know, he was, he was a guy who played... He, he played Thrall in the games. And he had this big, this big thing about Thrall being the center of everything. And that was a lot of what hold, held the movie up, is that they wanted to skip the initial invasion... And just go to Thrall's storyline because he's green. He, at that point, he was Green Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, but believe me, the, the movie's another thing that we could talk about for hours. But when it came to get, getting back to Warlords of Draenor, um, this was actually the first time I ever got in on beta testing. So I was a beta tester on the game. Not that it was a credited thing or anything, because, you know, they don't do those type of things. But um, I could see it being more akin to Burning Crusade, uh, mainly because, yes, it is using a lot of the same areas and everything else as, as in the game. But I think this is where they, they were really grasping at straws for, for storyline. And a lot of it came with the problem being... One, there was a lot of focus on the movie. And two, this is when you started getting a lot of the novels coming out. Um, you know, I love the Christy, anything that Christy Golden writes, absolutely brilliant. Love her writing, love her writing style. Um, her book, Arthas, is one I will constantly reread because, again, one, Arthas is a great villain. Mm -hmm. And she wrote, wrote an absolutely brilliant origin story for him. But this is where you needed to have read one of the books in order to understand why this was even happening in the first place. You know, there was there was after everything that happened in Pandaria, or Pandaria, you never found out why Garrosh escaped and how he was able to go back in time. But you had to go and read a book to find out. So there's a lot of story and development that was left in a book that a lot of people didn't read. So when you come into it, you're coming into it at the middle of a story instead of at the start of a story. So from a from a gameplay standpoint, it was just terrible. It just really became this this thing where you didn't know why you were there other than Garrosh had time traveled. Okay, cool. How? Why? Go read this book to find out. Well, I'm not spending 20, 30 bucks on a book to read it. But I, I did anyway, because I was obsessed with the lore at that point. Mm -hmm. But I, I think this was very much a... I, I called this a, a... For me, this was a this was the second half of a story. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you had the start of everything with Garrosh and his corruption through the, the the evil spirits and everything else, this is where you find out, you know, he drops the, the bomb on, uh, the mana bomb on um, Theramore, mm -hmm. which, which again, read the book version, so much better. And they, they were really trying to build him up as this big, big evil. And you got all of that until you go, oh, um, crap. 
okay, why did Thrall just nuke him out of nowhere? <laughs> why? Because he's green, Jesus. Like, this is, like, again, storytelling, law standpoint, none of it made sense. Yeah. And it was just really badly, badly done. And I'm going back and I'm looking at the patch notes and stuff that came along at this time. This was one of the shorter patch uh, patch content. You know, we we only had 6.0, 6.1, and 6.2. A lot of it was spent doing things that people either didn't want or want to put back in. This was this was the flying debate. This is where it began. Because a lot of people who had had flying in other expansions, they wanted to have flying in Draenor when they hit max level. Because once you hit max level, all you can do really is dungeons and raiding. And if you were to try and do anything else, it got boring because you're on the ground all the time. It took forever to get everywhere. Mm -hmm. So if you so if you're hunting rares or or whatever, then it was boring as anything. Uh, so, you know, the, the community started going, we want flying back. And the developers started putting down this hard stance of, no, you will not get flying ever in this game. We are done with flying. We hate flying. We don't like flying. We want you to stay on the ground and look at the texture, textures that we put together for the game. It was, it was starting to become more developers versus players. Developers wanted what they wanted instead of listening to the player base. And that's what started driving a lot of people away. Is this was that first hard line? Developers want X, Y, Z. Players want A, B, C. And the developers didn't even want to come to the table to hear it. They've eventually put flying back into it at the final patch, hmm. but they gated it so badly behind reputation grinds and. Uh, you know, rare. You had to kill rares for a certain item that only drops a certain amount of times a day, or you could only get a couple of them a day, or something like that. And it just took forever to unlock. It was just, and that was because the developers were having a hissy fit because they had to put in something that they didn't want to put in. Mm -hmm. So again, when when the developers stopped listening and started telling the players what they want. That's when you start losing people. You know, you got to remember this is this is the same as many other entertainment mediums. When you know, you and I are both wrestling fans. Mm -hmm. Look at what happened when Junior started telling the fans of the WWE what they want, instead of turning around and saying, "What do you want?" You know, when you start having the big Cena and Roman Reigns pushes. Because you know Vince, because Junior loves those guys, whereas the fans are going, we want to see guys like Daniel Bryan, we want to see guys like CM Punk, we want to see the New Day, we want to see all these other guys. But Junior says, no, you don't want to see this. You want to see what I'm telling you. You should, you want to see. Mm -hmm. That is bad business. Yeah, and this also bring this also brings us to, to one of the. One of the more co one of the more controversial elements when it came to the business end of of World of Warcraft. I've been putting I've been putting it off long enough in this episode, and I did um, I did talk about this on Sunday, but <sighs> let's talk about the level boost because <laughs> Draenor. I don't rec I don't recall if the level boost was in Pandaria. If it was, I didn't. I either didn't see it, or it did, or it wasn't as abrasive. But I do remember it in Draenor. And uh, I, if I remember correctly, I think it was in Pandaria, but I can't remember exactly. I think it was like very late. Yeah, which is, but in but. In in Draenor, I start we started to see more of it, and I, a bit smartassingly, had said that 
the people who demand an easy mode for Dark Souls and the people who defended the level boost in WoW are cut from the same cloth. I will note I did watch um, Mad Season Show's video on uh, level boosts, that near hour-long video called The Ballad of the Level Boost, which made a lot of really good points, I thought. Mm -hmm. But I do... One thing, one thing that really struck me was one of the main defenses of the level boost that I heard from a combination of both um, both people defending it and the developers is the new player defense. Which for me personally, I thought was always kind of stupid. Yeah. A, a, a new player isn't always going to go and go straight into a level boost. They're going to make the choice on if they want to start from the very beginning and work their way through, or they're going to go straight into the level boost because they want to get into the most modern content. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really go yay or nay on either because, I'll be honest, I have used level boost many times. I, I have you. I I've used it. I used it a couple of times during Miss Pandaria when it was first put in place. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I did buy Warlords Adrenal, which came with a level with a with a character boost, and I used it. Same with Legion. Same with Battle Azeroth. Same with Shadowlands. Every single one of them come came with a level boost when I bought the game, and I have used them. I have even used a level boost in Final Fantasy fourteen. Yeah, and. I think it. I think it. I think the presence of it is less of the problem than, the than the way it's um presented. Um, obvious and obviously the fact that, in some cases it in some cases it's a, it's a it is a bit of a service problem. But I do. But um. One of, but. What I do find what I do find kind of amusing with um, war with warlords is that is the whole apo the whole apology thing, and I I can't help but wonder if um, much li much like much like with the streamlining we mentioned earlier, they start they overcompensated a, a little bit when it came to when it came to the when it came to the mistakes of Dra of Draenor. How so? Uh, in ter in terms of in terms of going in the going in opposite extremes. When it came to some of the stuff that they were that they were trying, although, give but, it's it's one of those things where it's a bit of a quagmire. Um, but then we get to Legion, which um, I remember Legion, um, actually actually being well received. Unfortunately, for I think for a lot of people on the historical end of on at looking at it as a historian, um, Legion is going to be remembered for for being for being the expansion that got caught in the crossfire with the infamous "you think you do, but you don't" um, moment. Mm. Well, Le Legion for me, from a player point of view, was where I where I start to actually sour on the expansion. Well, on, on the game in general, actually. I think this was the first time in a long time where I actually took six months off from playing the game after playing it for, God, uh, over ten years at that point. Mm -hmm. Mainly because this almost felt like it was a filler, but it had some interesting highlights to it which eventually started becoming a downfall once Blizzard worked out that these things were popular. And I'm speaking of the the concept known as borrowed power. And Legion was the one where you had the weapons. Mm -hmm. the, the specialty weapons that were legendary uh, level that you built up over time. While that worked great, in the beginning, it very quickly became a mess of trying to min-max. It was a mess of stuff being so random 
in drop rate that if you needed something specific for a raid, you just have to pray that you get it. Uh, this was also, you know, as good as those weapons were, they really sort of lost the value of getting legendary items. Because around this point, we had gone... I remember Warlords of Draenor... I think it was one of the final... No, no, sorry, uh, I've got it wrong. It's this. It was this uh, Legion and the next expansion where Legendary dropped like candy. Mm -hmm. And it, a lot of that level of item just really lost its value. And when you start losing the value in the items, you start losing value in the play experience. Now they did try; they did do some decent stuff. Resort, uh, Return to Karazhan. I thought that was a great, uh, great patch, but you could tell it was a filler mm -hmm. because Karazhan at that point was dead and buried. It, it was from a law perspective; it was no longer needed. Um, Tomb of Sargeras was just a pain in the ass. And everything to do with Argus was a pain in the ass. I, I don't know why we had to become space people. But then again, I'm about to go into uh, Endwalker, where once again we're going into the moon. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to it for some reason. But then again, that's the difference between Final Fantasy storytelling and World of Warcraft storytelling. Yeah, which is something we'll, <laughs> something we'll get into later. Um, I, know, but... I, know we say that I know we say that a lot. I know we say that a lot. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to jump around like a pinball or so, or something. No, no. Um, plus, but like, yeah, like to, to just keep just keeping it on on Legion. Mm -hmm. I, again, like you said, this was a lot of where we saw more of the the developer mindset of you will take what we give you and be thankful for it. Mm -hmm. This is what you want because we tell you this is what you want. They didn't learn from the mistakes that they made with Warlords of Draenor. But they tried to hide it behind some fancy new ideas. It's like, hey, you now get access to some of the legendary weapons in Warcraft history. Cool. Okay, that sounds really good. But you, you, have you fixed all the other problems you did from the last expansion? Oh, no, 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 no. You get a fancy new weapon. When it came to you know? our, one thing that I remember... Um... I remember being hyped up when it came to the whole artifact thing is mm. that is that the effects that you could unlock with artifacts, which seemed to be a reincarnation of the Titan forging idea they had to scrap was that was that you could use it to get to, um, to look at, ta to look at talents you may have overlooked in a new way. But the problem, the problem is it's all fucking passives. Yeah. And, I will admit this is this is this is me putting my game designer hat on, but um, passives as a reward for a milestone for a lot of people aren't isn't going to be isn't going to be satisfying. No, um, a lot, especially especially when you're especially when it comes to those milestones, having a having a very limited amount that you're going to be getting. Um, I liken it to. When when someone le when someone levels up in a ta in a ta in a single player or a tabletop RPG, and what they get is a what they get is um, a bunch of stat a bunch of modifiers to core stats, especially when it comes to um, video game RPGs. Whereas, if you think about say um, let's I'll say Final Fantasy, just these single player ones. Individual leveling up doesn't matter as much as when you level up and you get a whole new, and you learn a new ability. If if I'm making any sense with this, yeah, yeah. Believe me, the, the the idea of uh, you, in Legion, you're going along, you're doing this massive quest line, and um, what you what your reward at the end of it? Oh, another passive thing to slot into your weapon, which might either be anything from uh, just increasing strength by plus whatever, uh, or you know it might add a change to your ability. Mm -hmm. You weren't actually getting any proper rewards; you were just getting temporary placeholders until you get something better. Yeah, 
because again, these things were uh, common, uncommon, rare, and epic. Although, so unless unless you were looking at replacing something with another thing, you weren't really getting much value out of your questing and your playtime because those things were the main focus mm -hmm. of your power. Yeah, and having to to run that again, the borrowed power idea was is not it's not rewarding. It's just another grind to keep you playing at the and to keep you spending your money. Yeah. This um, is and, and that beca that becomes a big crutch from here on out. Yeah. Now, since the since this since we talked about the inclusion of the of the previous two um brand spanking new he um heroic classes, I figured we'd I figured we should follow suit when it comes to the introduction of the demon hunter in Legion. Cuz you you cuz you um you weren't that you weren't that keen on death knights. You were more keen on monks. How did you feel about um, demon hunters? I it, it took until after Legion for me to appreciate them. When I when I first played them, I saw them just as another version of Rogue. They were just quick, stabby guys that were locked into a single race and if you want to be Illidan then that's what you were you know it, it was I felt like that was more for the convention role player crowd who loved dressing up as a, a character and that type of thing mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't see it as an actual decent required class until God, much later, until probably somewhere during the end part of Battle for Azeroth where I was talking with other people who really researched the class and I got to learn the class properly. Mm -hmm. Then I could see that the versatility being tank or DPS for them was actually quite good and it was actually a different way of playing a melee class. Um, instead of rogues where you're trying to be more stealthy and, and you know chain combos, these guys were just quick strikes. Quick strike in, do your damage, jump out, quick strike in, do your damage, get out. It was a very different play style. One that I didn't appreciate at the time probably had a lot to do with the fact that they were everywhere once again. But again, that wasn't due to them being OP or anything. If anything, they were actually very underwhelming when they first came out. But it was just because they were the, the fresh new thing, everybody just wanted to play them because the restrictions required to use them was unlocked from the get-go. Like, if you if you had hit max level and done all, everything that you were supposed to do in Wallets of Draenor, mm -hmm. you could instantly unlock the Demon Hunter for Legion day one. You didn't have to wait until you got to the end of that expansion in order to use the in order to use the character, or to use the class rather. Mm -hmm. So believe me, they were everywhere, and it just got annoying. So I didn't play them until much later when the hype had died down. Yeah, I could I could most certainly see that. Um, and then we then we end up getting to um, battle for Azeroth, and. Battle for Azeroth. If there was anything that, if there was anything that felt like it was trying to, it was it was trying to call 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 up to the um, up to the film, one would think it would be it would it would be this, or at the very least trying to call for um, nostalgia because the friggin' cover of this expansion was trying to evoke the old orcs versus hum orcs versus humans art from the original Warcraft. Yes. But, I will I'll be flat I'll be flat out honest. Um I feel like a lot of the brand new additions to bat to Battle for Azeroth felt like it was trying to turn WoW into a single player game. Especially um gar especially garrisons. I didn't mind the war mode, but garrisons and the stuff you could do with them, which we were already starting to see. 
it you ended up having the issue of if I'm not raiding, why why would I team up with other people? Yeah, but they they had tried this earlier during um was it all that was all that to drain or no. I'm trying. I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, it was Warlords of Draenor because you had garrisons back then, and this was just more of a an expansion upon that idea. But I think this was this really comes about as Blizzard trying to make up for two expansions worth of neglect. Like, there was a lot in this expansion that got patched in pretty quickly just to appease fiends. Mm -hmm. You know, um, time walking was became a thing, so they were playing high on the nostalgia. Uh, there was a lot of updates to very um, popular events, such as uh, the Darkman Fair, Children's Week, Brawler's Guild... They, they were really playing on that. Um, flying got put in a lot earlier in this than it had in any other expansion for the last couple of expansions. Mm -hmm. There were, you know, they recruited, they revamped Recruiter Friend. They, re they redid the auction house to be uh, cross faction mm -hmm. rather than being two factions. They really tried a lot in this. As a we're sorry for two expansions of screwing the pooch, and it came across as too much, too late for a lot of people, and it just eventually just became just too much in general. Yeah, and plus, plus also the fact that uh, this was the the expansion where the horde got absolutely royally screwed over when it came to uh, quest content. Because um, uh, Zandalar, where they had their main city, was so remote from every other bit of content to do that it just became a pain to try and do anything on the, in the area. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Alliance, theirs was better located for the questing that had to be done. So it almost felt like that there was this big alliance bias at the time. And, yeah, it just didn't come off that well. Plus, you know, when you... Your, your big uh, final push um, before screwing everything up completely <laughs> was, hey, we're going to make an island of robotic gnomes. And this is going to be a questing hub and a raid area and a dungeon area. And you need, and you're going to need this as a rep grind for unlocking new graces and stuff like that that are coming in the next expansion. Screw you, Blizzard. I hate gnomes. This, this, this would be like, uh, you know, after we're done with, uh, with Endwalker and we're doing everything on the moon, Yoshi P goes, Hey, you know what? I'm going to add in a bit of content where you have to spend the next three months of questing on an island of Lalafell. I just want to walk around punting them. Zan and I have a, a, a man after my own heart. Zan and I have a have a policy of do your civic duty, bully the potato. <laughs> no, no, you, you pat the potato to get them in a false sense of security, and then you punt them to the moon. Yeah. They were the, we the warrior of light wasn't the first to, wasn't the first to make it to the moon. It was the potatoes that we keep punting. <laughs> yes. You know it's kind of, it's kind of like that ASDF sketch about the kid going. I want to go to when I grow up. I want to go to the moon. Why wait? Punt. <laughs> yep. But when it comes to but when it came now when it came to. When it came to when it came to BFA, um, I do remember. We'll get we'll get into this in a bit, but I do remember a lot of people really not happy with how a lot of characters got treated. 
Like bo both on Alliance and Horde, yeah. a lot of the iconics get um got it's it was like everybody got some degree of character assassination. Yes. And once again, if you want to find out more about that, you had to read books. Which the, the, which, which had been a, a bit of a problem for many expansions during this time. And I... Uh, was it this one or the one after? No, this this was this was the expansion where they had a book in between. I had finished reading it, and I didn't get to the one... The one that came out just before Shadowlands, I got about halfway through the book before I went, fuck it. You know, I remember a lo I remember a long time ago when I absolutely ripped into the Hunger Games film, and a lot of people who def tried to defend the film by say by saying that things I thought didn't make sense made more would make more sense in the book. Nope. And I had one, it didn't. Two, I shouldn't have to read the book, which is the policy I have with this with this with this obsession with putting more of the lore in supplementary material if if i should not i should be able i don't think it's unreasonable of me especially given what you're paying to expect a com a completed story within the within an expansion that i sh i should not have to get supplementary material to fill in the holes that your story writers couldn't yep totally agree with you there as like, I, did, I, I, I didn't mind, like, when it comes to supplementary material and the storylines contained within, there are times where there's stuff that is produced that I will actually read and enjoy. Mm -hmm. The only times that I have found that to be has been with villain-centric books. I've already made mention of the, the Arthas book. There was also another one that came out, I think, during the Legion... Um, called Stormrage, mm -hmm. which gave you a lot more background on the Illidan Stormrage. Now, this had come out many, many years earlier, you know, before BC came out, then people might have given a damn about the character back then. But uh, you got a little bit more of him because he was a feature player in Legion. Mm -hmm. So the book, again, became this nice companion piece. What annoys me is when I have to go and read everything that happens between uh, Battle for Azeroth and Shadowlands in another book. You know that that's where I go. No, this is what this is the story writer's job should be to tell the story within the context of the game itself. And if you cannot do that, then go back to writing school and learn your craft. And um, of course, that bring that brings us to um, Shadowlands. You had you had mentioned that you had mentioned that it's been about a year since you had played. So would it be? So I don't think it would be unreasonable for me to say that Shadowlands was the expansion where you where you snapped. Um, yes. Now, well, I I, uh, well, I might be exaggerating when I say I haven't played for a year. I played the first three months of Shadowlands. Mm -hmm. Mainly because I was stupid and I bought a three month sub thinking, eh, this will be fun. No. I, re I regretted that and I was really annoyed that I couldn't get a, a refund. I This was also the first time I had actively gone out of my way to review a game on launch or not long after launch. Mm -hmm. um, as people who might have visited us here on Geekwatch uh, during my couple of experiences times on the panel i work with the outer haven a video game pop culture website mm -hmm. and i am a reviewer i ripped the living shit out of everything to do with shadowlands like i massacred this thing from top to bottom so much that my that the pr people that i know who represent square enix read my review, and said, would you like a copy of Final Fantasy XIV? <laughs> now, they, they, they said, that I, I had the email that said, we read your review of 
World of Warcraft Shadowlands, and it seems like you were quite upset and very um, aggravated with the content. We would like to offer you a um, a couple of game codes for everything up till uh, up to the Shadowbringers at the time. Mm-hmm. If you would like to play, and then I received an email a couple of weeks later. It's, not even a week later or a couple of days later, saying, actually, here, we can do you one better. We will give you Endwalker. (laughs) So you will have everything up to Endwalker. You won't have to pay for a single expansion. All you have to do is pay for the game time. And if you want to do a review on these as you go, we're more than happy to take that as thank you. You know. (laughs) So when you have PR people from other companies going... Hey, we're seeing you're upset with this game that you've been playing for nearly 15 years at this point. Um, would you like to try playing another? <laughs> now, we'll help you get into it. I'd like to now, given given the fact that the big accelerant for a lot of for a lot of the Exodus has a lot of the Exodus that I, I mentioned this on Sunday has, of course, been the lawsuits that Activision Blizzard is still mired in. Mm-hmm. Um. Was th- was that a factor in you leaving, or would or would this have happened event? Would this? I I I had le- I had left long before any of these accusations came to life. Um, I was one of the people, uh, the big exodus of players who had just had enough of the shit of, of being treated like shit by the developers, who got sick of the toxic communities, who got sick of um, re, re, if you wanted to see content and you had to be a part of a progression raiding guild we uh, there were so many people who had quit Shadowlands because there was so much involved in the game itself at a base level mm-hmm. from borrowed power to too much um, too many things that you had to take into account to min-max uh, there was once again this thing where you're creating legendaries, and if you didn't have the right legendary from the get-go, you were screwed, or you'd have to go and craft it from the beginning, which means you had to go and re-get Soul Ash and all this other crap. Uh, and then you had all the currencies you had to do for the for the broker. Then you know there, there was too there was too much. Then you had all the the stuff that was promised in these. Um, I can't remember what they're called now. The factions that you were joining, covenants. Yeah, the covenants. You know, you you had two or three things that you had to start managing there as well. And then then when you go out into doing, it, it, unless you were raiding, you weren't getting what you need, needed to hit these things. And there was this gigantic focus on you had to be doing high level raiding if you weren't running. Um, mythic plus dungeons every day at plus 15, then you weren't going to get anywhere. You know, if you weren't doing that alongside mythic plus raiding, then you weren't going to get anywhere. And at the same time, you're looking at the gear system itself became screwed because, because Blizzard decided that we've been giving out too much free gear for many years. We're going to revamp the gearing system to have drop rates be next to goddamn nothing. But you get this wall of nine things that if you do, you know, you have to do your heroic dun- uh, your heroic plus dungeons, you have to do your PvP grind, you had to do your, your, uh, your raid bosses every week, and you can get to pick of one piece out of nine every week for all your efforts. But because it's all on a random loot table that is not designed to increase your chances of getting the gear you want, nine times out of ten, you're picking gold because all the other stuff is crap. Mm-hmm. This this was where you... This is where we went... The, the term... The, the terms came in at this point in time that are now starting to become way too commonplace when it comes to World of Warcraft. One of them is, instead of referring to people as players... We are payers. 
because that's that's all that I see us as is walking wallets. Mm. Because there was more focused on six month subscriptions. There's more focused on uh, you know, your cosmetic cash item, thing. cash items, mm. all that type of stuff. And you know they wanted to keep you paying. They want you to pay. They don't want you to play because the gameplay was shit. They want you to pay. And those, and that's when you start having this, the biggest exodus of this entire thing is because of Shadowlands, because people got sick of being referred to as payers instead of players. Mm-hmm. Those that left are now on this wonderful, sniffable drug known as copium. And copium is what is keeping this game from dying in the ass like it needs to and getting the developers to actually pay attention again. It, all these people who continue to play it and go, oh, the, great, the game's still great. You just don't have the time anymore. Yep. Or you're too old for the game or you, some other excuse. You know, they're the ones that are sitting there going, oh, on copium all day. Mm-hmm. Whereas you started, this is where you started seeing so many people and there's this absolutely hilarious, there's a couple of hilarious videos. State of WoW. <laughs> is that the, yeah, is the state, state of WoW, the state of WoW, and there's another one from um, uh, Carbot Tunes, where they show the characters that have been playing World of Warcraft, going over to Final Fantasy, and like Final Fantasy is like this gigantic theme park, and they look back at World of Warcraft, and it's like on fire, and it's got bots just walking into a wall. You know, it's like, and that was another thing, like bots. Oh, have become yeah. so prevalent over the last over the last three four expansions, and Blizzard have done nothing. Why? Because it's more money in their pocket, mm-hmm. and it just it just became such an annoying thing that the players are sick of it, mm-hmm. and that's why you had what essentially is the part of the Exodus trilogy. So many people going from Azeroth to Exodia. And now with with the now on um, one we've talked we've talked a whole lot about the mechanic ends of things, but I'd like to go into the lore. And for me personally, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to how the lore and how the narrative of of WoW was treated, there are there's there are two there are two major shifts in disfavor that I find very emblematic. I'd say the first one is the is the fact that in the early days you were just an adventurer among many. But as time went on, especially with Shadowlands, they wanted to shift towards you being some kind of chosen one, but didn't have the balls to actually go all the way in and writing you as a chosen one. Which is which is where you get the whole like in Shadowlands get the whole Maw Walker thing that doesn't mean anything when you're dealing with characters you've already met several times over by this point. Mm. Like it makes it makes no sense for somebody like say Jaina to call you that to call you that when you've already met her dozens of times by this point. Yeah, and before that they reference you as champion. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that disassociation comes from problematic writing where they want you to try and because by this point you gotta remember we, we've gone from vanilla wow where we were fighting you know dwarf kings and uh dragons and stuff like that to all the way through to the legion where we were fighting gods mm-hmm. essentially um and we had just come off Battle for Azeroth, where we were taking down uh, the old gods. We were taking on mythic level beings. Like this is this is like taking on Galactus or the Eternals, or you know, after after we built any, up to that point after so long. Taking on any any cosmic character that Jack Kirby has written. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's essentially. Um, and then, then we go to what we would assume, or we could have assumed would have been the personification of death itself, 
but it's really just another it, it was another sort of eternal level being or like the, it's like going back to like I said you know this is like taking on Galactus and going back back to Thanos yeah. it's a step it's a step down and especially when the focus of the story was meant to be Sylvanas which we'll, but the we'll entire time, we've minute. just had the j- the jailer going, I'm on hey, Sepi, you! Yeah. Um, Zilval, the jailer, whichever you want to call him, um, the big problem, the big problem that I find him to be an absolute failure as a villain. Mm-hmm. And the large reason for that is that he is not a villain. He is a plot device. Mm. Because... All, through, all throughout, all, first off, we once again have an issue of bringing in somebody and being told they're, th- they're this ultimate big bad without actually showing it. You know, the whole show don't tell that every film and every theater student yes. and every writing student had beaten in their heads in college. But we also, ha- we also have the fact that, he, that the only way to really make him a threat is by imply, implying a piggybacking of everything that came before. The idea that he was subtly manipulating everything that we saw, which um, ends up flattening the the scope of the world. This idea that the stuff with Arthas, the stuff with the Burning Legion, Mm. on on and on and on and on, was somehow all part of his all part of his grand plan, as if he's as if he's fucking Moriarty or something, if you don't mind a deep cut. And the pro- the problem is is that in in doing so you think that you're make you're building them up as this big bad when all you're doing is making the making the um efforts of the last fifteen years seem al- seem almost trite especially because when the build up of this like the pre patch during uh battle for Azeroth was so focused on Sylvanas again. You know, we were taking we're taking down um, what's his name, Nathaniel. Yeah. And you know, we, it was like they were saying everything, like the marketing, the the pre start, and everything, where she goes to the ice crown and rips the the helm in half and everything else. It made her look like she was going to be the big bad. Then we arrive in Shadowlands, and then we get, I'm the jailer. I'm the fire and the steps ahead of you. Look right in your balls. What? Yeah. Like it, it make it makes no sense narratively. It, it, the guy has, like you said, the only way we can get away with this guy being the big bad is to retroactively go back and change every storyline that has come before it. Oh. There, there, there is no. This is this is a for for those of you who 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 might be in the UK or something like that. This is this is a timeless child from Doctor Who. Oh, don't get me fucking started on that again. This, this, this is this, <laughs> this is this is this is retconning years of storylines to try and make one one decision or one character fit into the current narrative, mm-hmm. and it fails on every single level. Yeah, which is which is what which is um why I th- why I think a lot. It's funny you mentioned. Look, I could. I ended up. I ended up ranting in a call up for like an for like an hour about how about how fucking retarded the timeless child thing was. And this is not. It doesn't make me angry as much. But one of the one of the things I was getting at and why I'd, and why I call Zoval a plot device is we know abs. We know what we actually know about his motivations is extremely paper thin. The whole thing of wanting to remake time and the whole thing with the first ones, when we don't even know who the fuck the first ones are. Um, that that'll be the next expansion. Cold com- cold comfort for us now. <laughs> and the f- the thing that I find especially funny is that in hindsight, it's a repetition of the same fi- of the same problem that I had with Cataclysm. Like I'm. When Deathwing showed up, what what the fuck did we know about De- what the fuck did we know about Deathwing aside, aside from aside from some some ve- some very deep cuts? And when it ca- with Zoval, it's even worse because we know absolutely nothing about him, 
And since we brought it up a couple of times, I want to talk a bit about Sylvanas. Because that was the other in, that was the other strong indictment when lo when looking at Sylvanas Windrunner over the years. Since for Sylvanas has been one of the more one of the more popular characters throughout the game's tenure. And yet it didn't take it didn't take long for people f for people to go from loving Sylvanas to her getting um Roman Reigns heat. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, yeah. it's worse. It's X Pac Heat. No, no, no. We'll keep it at Roman Reigns. Uh, just before, before I continue mm -hmm. with this, I uh, just want to put a pause on for a moment. I just want to turn my dinner down. Is that all right? Oh, go ahead. I'll just be 30 seconds. All right. And we're back. Um, and I realize the term Mary Sue gets, th gets thrown around a lot when it comes to, when it comes to discussions of fiction. And the definition of what counts as a Mary Sue gets gets muddled, sometimes sometimes by bad actors who want who want to claim who want to um, pull a um, accusation of hypocrisy. But I do th I do think that over time, um, Sylvanas did lean a bit too much into the into the Mary Sue simply be simply because of how she just steamrolls through so through so many. Care through so many um, pillars of um, of Azeroth over time. Mm. Yes and no. Um, I, th I think a lot of it came from the fact that a, a lot of people, and this is probably a due or slight misconception as well. The fact that she goes walks into uh, practically just appears out of nowhere in Stormwind. Slaps the absolute crap out of Anduin, which I thought was hilarious because that little bitch has been needing it for years. Um, but also, she goes to Ice Crown and she takes on what is essentially the Lich King, the the being that created her in her current form. You know, going back to her days of she was Ranger, uh, Ranger General in the Night Elf Army during one of the original invasions from this the Scourge, she got resurrected by as a Banshee in the service of the Lich King. And yet now she's going into basically his house, grabbing his helmet and ripping it to shreds with her bare hands, something that nobody's even been able to do. Now... I think a lot of people saw that and went, okay, she's a Mary Sue. She suddenly got all this power out of nowhere. My explanation is slightly different. This hasn't been too long. This has probably been maybe a couple of years after Bolvar put on the helmet at the end of Wrath of the Lich King. You know, if you, if you count each expansion being maybe a year to two years. He Bolvar does not succumb to the corruption of the the demon that is a part of the armor. Therefore, he doesn't have the same level of power as Arthas did. So, her coming up and beating the crap out of Bolvar as the Lich King so easily isn't isn't really much of a stretch because the guy hasn't melded with the the magic of the, the armor. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the same control over it. He doesn't have the same experience with it. So, you know, her kicking, her, her getting that all done so easily, not much of a stretch when you really think about it. But it was, it was from there where a lot of the problems started popping up again. Like, she... She was actually, for what she did, she was a very effective war chief. She was also probably the wrong choice, but, you know, that's what happens when you have death gods uh, whispering in the ear, Mr. Bolgin. Mm -hmm. um, which, uh, again, that's more stuff in books that you got to read about in order to understand. But I, I don't see her as a Mary Sue. And after really thinking about, like, I did get the, I, I joined that angry Sue, sec, uh, the, uh, 
the Mary Sue section that, that went after her when she started. And I went, no, hold on, step back. Look at it from other angles. And that's where I got my current theories from. Mm-hmm. But, um, again, it comes back to her right. The writing has really screwed her over yet again. She was meant to be built. They built her up through two expansions to try and be this big bad, this big evil. Now she's just yet another servant. Ooh. Like she's she she she's essentially a servant of Serval at this point. Mm-hmm. I can't say for anything that's come out from patch nine point one onwards because I haven't experienced it, nor have I bothered to even look into it. But. You know, she was meant to be the big bad. And yet again, they've sidelined her for somebody else. I don't know why. Technically, she should be the big bad of this expansion. But from what I was seeing people, like, wanting in the in the forum sections before I quit the game, was they wanted, to, they wanted her to have a redemption arc. And I'm like, no, you can't have a character like that have a redemption arc unless you have a redemption arc for Garrosh. Because both characters are a bit on the same level. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. By this point, I've given up caring. Yeah, and, um... I think... I think the... I've, I've, it's, this isn't one of those cases where you can just say, trust the process. No. If you'll, if you'll forgive me for using a, for using a basketball but, reference. It, because, 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 once again, if you're going to find out exactly what's happening with Sylvanas and everything... You're gonna have to read another book that is in production at the moment. Yeah, and that and that again, you're again you're dealing with you're dealing with outside material, and it's a cold comfort to to those who to those who were inv- who were invested in the in the character for so long. Mm. Oh, is. One one particular one particular argument that I hear that I hear a lot in defense of of bad storytelling is the whole it's not especially when talking about bad endings is it's not the destination it's the journey. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't agree with this one bit. A bad destination can inv- can invalidate the journey. Yes. And since you brought since you brought up. Um, Doctor Who. I'll bring up something adjacent to de- to demonstrate my point. Miracle Day. You'll have to explain. Um, that was that was the third um, series when it came to Torchwood. That was co-produced by Stars. Uh, and it's been quite it's been quite a while since I've watched Torchwood. Yeah. Um, when it came to Torchwood, season one. Um, sorry, I keep old ha- old habits. In my defense, I'm American. Um, series one was crap. Series two was a little less crap. It seemed like they were hitting their stride with Children of Earth. Then Miracle Day happened, and all that goodwill washed away because you have this whole mystery about this miracle and de- and death not existing, and how everyone's trying to cope with this ch- with how the world's changed. And when it comes to the actual mystery and how it's solved, it's completely unsatisfactory. And they had the gall to try and do a sequel tease. Which, of course, never happened. Along with the most obnoxious editing I think I've ever seen. But the point is is that you, ha- you had a mystery, you, and, if you, and you have to solve it in a way that feels satisfactory to the amount of time you've had people investing. So when you throw in something like Zoval... After go after going for what I'd what I'd say four five maybe six years of trying to build up um, Sylvanas as as the next big bad, you can't just throw something like that in when you've been doing build up for when you've been doing long term booking for that long. Mm. That's the way I see it, at least. Oh. So once again, to bring bring out a, a nice little love of wrestling into this, um, the storyline so far for Shadowlands has been watching the build for Hogan versus Sting in '98, complete with the Starcade ending. 
Oh uh, yeah, the mystery that will that will forever remain unsolved, or rather, has several solutions, and all of them don't make sense. Well, yeah, it was a year, a, a full year of build up between Hulk Hogan and Sting in World Championship Wrestling, where these guys never even touched. Mm -hmm. uh, leading up to the big pay per view, Starcade at the end of 1998, and then the match itself was an absolute piss take of a match. It was terrible. And complete with an ending where you had referees getting knocked out and Bret Hart counting the win for no reason whatsoever, other than um, they tried to do a repeat of the screw job from Survivor Series 98. Mm -hmm. And it just went as like this great build this entire time. And then when you finally get to what was supposed to be the payoff, the payoff just fizzled and died. That is pretty much go is Sylvanas' arc from vanilla through to current point in time in Shadowlands. Mm -hmm. Now that bring, that now given given the thorough burial that we've done that we <laughs> done, that we've done to the point that um that I feel that I feel like we I feel like I may have borrowed a golden shovel with the amount of with the burial we've given we've given Azeroth. Um, it's okay. Uh, I'll put him over next time. <laughs> <laughs> but hang on. Sorry, had something had something in the back of my throat. Um, but when it comes to when it came when it came to your experiences with um Final Fantasy fourteen, and obviously. Obviously, you're no you're no stranger to jumping around. You weren't a you weren't a you weren't a one game lifer like so, like some people who may have made the jump. Mm. Um, but I would like I would like to I would like you to walk me through your experiences during during your first exposure to the stuff to the stuff that you were seeing with a realm reborn and just just that just get just getting a hang of the of the mechanical differences. <sighs> So yeah, I, my current run with Final Fantasy XIV has not been my only run. It's been my third, no, fourth attempt to get in the game. Mm -hmm. um, I did try very early on, like when they first had their first ever free trial or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, I tried giving it a go. For some reason, I couldn't wrap my head around it. Didn't, and... I went back to World of Warcraft. Um, I had also tried playing it on console as well. And believe me, I am one of those people who will say, if you're going to play an MMO, you play it on a PC, not a, not a uh, console. Just due to load times more than anything these days. Um, but this most recent time around, because I want to give it a good shot. Because one... I obviously I had the obligation to the PR people to at least give them a review of what I thought of the game for as much as I could play it. And I think that there have been a lot of improvements since my first time playing. I think the first time I tried playing it was probably when Heaven Sword was just a new game. Mm -hmm. So there have been a lot of quality of life improvements and stuff like that have been put in since. So going into it, it was very different. Um, I will admit it did take me some time to wrap my head around the, the way the game plays versus how I knew, or at least how I thought a MMO was played. Coming in from World of Warcraft, where you walk into an area, you do all the quests, and you move on. I took that mindset into Final Fantasy and realized that I had screwed up majorly. Because Final Fantasy is more of a narrative-driven game than anything else. Your usage of the main story quests will determine a lot of your leveling experience. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't realize that until I was somewhere around about level 45 of a level 50 level cap for um, Realm Reborn. Mm -hmm. 
I had to go back to my story quests where I was level 17 <laughs> and could and play it from there to play it properly. So that was it was a bit jarring, but once I understood the way the game played and it, it was a very narrative driven experience um I so sort of, I began to enjoy myself more because I started going back to the early days of vanilla World of Warcraft where it was more about the story and the journey than oh my god I have to rush through this content so I can get to the end game mm-hmm. because uh, again you know Final Fantasy had this way of weaving dungeons and raids and everything into the story that you were going to get there anyway at some point. As opposed to, like, endgame content in World of Warcraft, where it was, you hit max level, then you do endgame content. Final Fantasy, you do all the content as you level through the main story quests. And a lot of it is to unlock the endgame stuff. Um, so doing it that way, once I, I unlearnt my bad World of Warcraft habits, I fell in love with games again, or at least MMOs mm-hmm. in, the, in that regard. So, like, mechanically speaking, outside of that leveling experience, a lot of it was just learning research um one of the first things i did when i started hitting i think it was about level 20 or 30 uh playing a bard Mm -hmm. is i jumped on uh on youtube and i went and i said and i just typed in archer or bard um well like the the God, brain blank. Basically, what the mechanics are, what your rotations are, all that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I researched, and I learnt, and I found rotations that worked, and I started using them. And I, it, it, that's something that's stayed with me throughout my entire playing experience, is that there's a wealth of knowledge out there. And if you're willing to either ask somebody or go looking for it, you'll find that knowledge. The difference with the games became very apparent straight out was on that quest for knowledge. Instead of having to be in a guild and having to t- discuss something over Discord with somebody for 20 hours, I could watch a five-minute video, get the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. But if, if I want to talk to somebody about it, they're more than willing to talk. It's not one of these things of, oh, I have to train you to play this way. It's... I want you to get the best experience out of your game. You can play this any way you like, but here's my suggestion. And going into major towns and just saying, hey, I'm new, I need help. People send you messages going, hey, how can I help? Instead of, fuck off, noob. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the first things I experienced as soon as I started I was in, see, I can't, I, I believe me, I'm not even going to try pronouncing any locations in Final Fantasy XIV. If there's any gripe I have it, is their naming conventions are terrible. But uh, one of the major cities that I started in, I walked up to do the first few quests and I went to uh, the Aetherite for the first time to get that done. All of a sudden, somebody's just opened a trade window and was like, Here's an event umbrella. Have fun. You're new. Here's some stuff. I didn't even ask for it. I didn't even say anything. And people were giving me stuff and like, oh, do you need do you need help? Did it? And it's like this again. It's the community and the vibe of the place, which is so different. Like I gone from being a, a World of Warcraft progression raider at the time, where if I didn't do my my plus 10 mythics every week and miss out on my gear or i didn't have the right gear for tanking that week in the raid people would yell and scream and you know all that that toxicity and everything else then to go into 
Final Fantasy going, hey, I'm new, I need help, or even just walking around, and people like, do you need help? Like, it was just such a, it was, it was light and, it was night and day. Yeah, and, of course, there, of course, when it comes to that, there is the factor of the, um, of the mentor program that Final Fantasy has. Um, mm. But I actually think, I actually think the mentor program is brilliant because it incentivizes both sides of the, of the equation to not, to not be so adversarial. Yeah, you're pretty much right there, man. <laughs> Can't fault you. But I just, but um, that also I also bring when it comes to when it came to your experiences with it. Did you, obviously when it came to the um, when it came to the dungeon runs, there had been, there's of course been those. But when it came, but when it came to doing full on raids, like say the like say the coils of Bahamut or Crystal Tower, um. I'm curious what you. I'm curious, what your takeaway from those after doing after doing um your handful of raids that you had done in WoW, comparatively speaking. There really is no real way to compare the two. Like mechanically speaking, Final Fantasy took a lot of what World of Warcraft had done with positionals and. Uh, phases and stuff like that and refine them and looked at things like the modding community where in World of Warcraft I was running 25 add-ons to do what Final Fantasy does as a default setting like things where you know if you're having to get a position on you see a, a pulsing circle on the ground you know, you needed an add-on for that stuff in World of Warcraft, whereas Final Fantasy gives this to you as a basic mechanic. Then there was things like, again, the community and the people that you play with, even if you're playing with randoms and you got stuck on something or you weren't hitting the DPS or whatever, everybody's like, okay, let's wipe, let's start again. Mm -hmm. And it was not a negative. There was no blame passed around. It was like, all right, cool. It's like um, one of the, the videos out there where they do that comparison and the character's like, oh, no, we wiped, so this is where we disband. You all suck. You know, No, I didn't pull that pack. And the, the guy's going, what are you talking about? Let's just get up and do it again. And the guy's like... What do you mean, do it, do it again? Aren't you afraid we're going to waste our time? And the, and the dude just replies, if we're going to waste our time, let's waste it together. You know, it, it's... Like, comparatively, like, mechanically, Final Fantasy is one of those things that has looked at WoW, has looked at its competitors, and said, let's take everything that the player needs and make it a base feature. Then you, then you have the community who has that different mindset of, you know what, if we're wasting time, let's waste it together, let's have a laugh, we'll get it eventually. Yeah, sometimes it may take longer than others, looking at you, looking at you, mm -hmm. uh, look at, looking at you, the, some of the, some of the um... G Garuda Extreme. That took um, friggin' Garuda, forever. Garuda and Titan were the bane of my existence for weeks. Mm -hmm. Yep. Especially, especially Titan with that, with that, with that, fit, with that shrinking ring bullshit. Yep. Um. Yep. But eventually, you you get a random either if you're doing random groups around right the group finder, or if you're doing it with with a guild or a, a free company, mm -hmm. then eventually you're gonna get it. Yeah, and that brings me to something else. The I'd like you to go. I'd like you to um. To go through your experiences comparatively when it comes to the, when it comes to the group finding content, the stuff like L, stuff like LFR and the, and the like that you had in WoW versus the group finder setup in um, fourteen and what your takeaways were. Very helpful, like when when it comes to, like again, it comes down to the community. 
World of Warcraft has become that very elitist, very up their own ass. You know, this this is I'm only doing this for a laugh, but you know, don't die because if you die, you're a noob and you shit and you know, cancel your sub and everything else. Mm-hmm. Whereas Final Fantasy, it's that same story. If we're gonna waste our time, let's waste it together. Let's have fun. If there's something that they that you don't, if you you die at the same spot a couple of times, somebody else would might turn around and go, "I notice you're dying at the same spot. Do you know you do you know the mechanics? Would you like us to stop and explain it?" Whereas if you try and do that in World of Warcraft, it's like, "No, nah, I haven't got time for, to explain shit to you. Go learn somewhere else. Go watch." fat boss videos or whatever. Mm-hmm. Whereas I've had times where, you know, I've had issues in a dungeon and we have stopped for five minutes or so while one of the more experienced players explained the mechanics. And was like, okay, does everybody got what we got to do? Yep, cool, let's go in. And then we go in and we smash it. Mm-hmm. Because we take that time to make sure everybody's on the same page. And it's all done polite and nicely. Whereas World of Warcraft became this thing where if you want to learn, go somewhere else and learn because we don't want to tell you anything. You have to come in here and be perfect straight away. Final Fantasy, you're allowed to be imperfect. You're allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed to die four or five times. It's fine. Mm -hmm. And now, the, now, since we since we talked a great deal about the about the lore end of things, I do think I do think it would be remiss if we did if we didn't um, if we didn't go into that. And I and since we did that, since we since we kind of did that um, expansion by expansion, I'd like to first start about your takeaways when it came to the core story of A Realm Reborn. Is I have a different perspective, being someone who played through Legacy and saw, uh, and saw the meteor incident happen as it as it was going down, and this this feeling of dread throughout that Zan described perfectly on Sunday. My experience with the Realm Reborn, again, because of the way I was playing it, I didn't get as much of the story as I should have. Since then, I have gone back and I've watched videos of the Mm storyline, and I understand it a bit more now. Um, While I can't recall everything in Realm Reborn, because it is a very, very long story Mm -hmm. to to open your MMO with, um, Realm Reborn is actually the longest of all sections of this game. And... There was just so much to get sort of caught up in, you know. You, there was there was your own personal journey where you are supposedly a chosen one, or a, you know, a, uh, the the light light bringer or whatever you want to call warrior, it. Warrior of light. War, war, warrior of light, yes. And then you've got the um, then you got the the the, the scions of the seven scrum dibilaps, yes, <laughs> and and what they do. Mm-hmm. Then you've got the Titans that you're taking on as well. Then you've got the um, the Imperium. Uh, the Garlean Empire the, the, is what you're. Is the, the, so, yeah. So again, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be dead on details because I, I. I'll be honest. I did rush a lot. Mm-hmm. But the Garlean Empire and what they're doing, because that storyline goes through pretty much the whole of Final Fantasy XIV. As I came to, to notice, there was a lot of that. Mm-hmm. And there were so many facets that you had to try and take on at once. So the storytelling did get a little muddled at times. But by the time you started getting to Endgame, you understood what was going on. So from a narrative standpoint, it was still, I think, A Realm Reborn was still trying to find its footing. Um, not having played 1.0 and only seen videos of Bahamut coming and being a badass that he is, mm-hmm. um, I could only begin to imagine what the whole story 
over 1.0 and Ram Ramon would look like. Mm-hmm. You know, as yourself say, you know, you've been, you went through 1.0. So you, you would see things from a different perspective than I do. Yeah. So coming off of this, and a lot of it being I had to find my footing, um, a Ram Ramon was very confusing for me but sort of started to streamline itself near the end. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that was my experience with that. Yeah. And that, of course, brings us to Heaven's Ward, which is where you, where you had, where we had our first proper expansion and the introduction of flying, as well as the, as well as the, um, as well as the, as well as that new set of classes and, and a general, um, a a a much di- a much different theme when it came when it came to that when it came to that story. So I'm curious your experiences with um, Heaven Sword's um, chapter. I'll I'll be honest, I skipped most of Heaven Sword. Um, that that was done on purpose. I had people telling me, um, skip it, mainly because it felt like a lot of uh, filler to a lot of people. But mechanically speaking, um, I was finding my footing with the game, understanding how the game wants to work, and working within the confines of the game. The flying mechanics that were introduced, I think, are a great way to not only explore and see the the, the graphical, uh, the artistry that was put into the game, and then you are rewarded at the end of it all by flying, and then you can go around and do whatever you like. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will be remiss that uh, this particular part is also where I started learning about how to unlock dungeons and raids to expand what was put forth in the stories. Um, I still have a lot of stuff that I should go back and try and solo, but I just haven't really bothered to try. Mm-hmm. Um, but like the, all I can remember is the final raid in this one where you're, you're running and the guy gets in the, was like a, like a robotic version of a hermit and he casts Ultima. Um. That what that was that was Ultima Weapon at the end of a realm. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. The end of yeah, because that because that because that one that one keeps coming up on a roulette too often. Um, the end of Heaven Sword was where you had to deal with effectively the Knights of the Round. Oh yes, yes. Um, that that battle I loved mm-hmm. actually. I I and the the thing is it doesn't come up often enough in my roulette. Uh, I love. Knights of the Round as a spell from Final Fantasy VII. Mm-hmm. So to, to be in a version where you have a guy who basically decides, I'm going to be a god king! And then you actually have to battle all 12 knights of the round. And, and are in a that, race against time so he doesn't use ultimate yep. end. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So that, that was that was a great great fight mechanics-wise. Uh, and just a, just a spectacle. Of a, of a fight with a great reference as well, but yeah, like unfortunately, like because I was trying to rush at this point, um, I wasn't paying as much attention to the story as I should have, yeah. and I think I do def- definitely need to go back and watch like videos or uh, some summaries over it. Yeah, because I, I think I, I, I think I, I listened to the wrong people at this point. I would certainly recommend that, especially given the prospect the um the fact that it do you do have a bigger introduction to dr- to dragons and a bit more when it comes to the pr- when it comes to the primals that you've seen. Um, and it and there's the fact that especially the fact that the dragons within the within the setting have a far different perception of time than the smaller races. As dragons often do. Mm-hmm. 
and it's it's one of those things that's always implied with dragons, but it's ne but it doesn't but it but dialogue wise they never go all the way with it. Um, and is and grant granted the granted it's not like it's perfect when it comes to that because it's kind of hard to write how um, it's kind of hard to write different perceptions of time. Mm. But did you did you end up skip did you end up skimming through Stormblood or not? I did at the beginning, but then I slowed down as I got further into it. Um, a, lot, a lot of what Stormblood really sort of got to me was I'm a big fan of the Asian building design and Asian aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So sort of seeing this more play out like the old school samurai films of, say, like the 19... 70s maybe not early 1980s you think you're thinking of kurosawa yeah. stuff yeah and sort of seeing a lot of that type of storytelling in that expansion uh it did make me slow down and start paying attention again mm -hmm. um and also at the same time this is where i was i had found a free company that i'm still with to this day and I realized, like, I had overleveled something shocking. So this is where I started getting a chance to play around with different, um, different classes, different jobs, and and stuff like that. So, narrative speaking, yeah, this was really good. Like, I enjoyed a lot of the story, but I'm just trying to remember that's. The ending for this one had that very sequel bait style to it. Mm -hmm. Like, like you had to take on the, the father, uh, started with the son and beating the shit out of him, and then you had to take on the father near the end with the big war. Mm -hmm. And then you find out, yeah, they're both still alive. Okay, so there's more stuff to come. Yay! But it, it, the ending wasn't as shocking as the one for... Um, for, for Heaven's Sword, where the dude took his head off. That was... Holy shit. <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah, like, again, I... My details are sketchy, just because I plowed through those two expansions in about two months straight. And so everything got the models, so... But, um... Yeah, it's sort of because it was that very Kurosawa inspirational... At least, at least in my eyes, I did slow down a lot more, and I got a lot more into other aspects of the game as well during this time. Mm -hmm. Damn you, Gold Saucer! <laughs> oh. and of course, la last but certainly not least, um, until uh, up until up until the near future, um, Shadowbringers. I will be very honest. I am still very early game. Um, as in, I've done the first set of quests, like the first 20 or so, and I've only just met, caught up with, uh, one of the, the twins mm -hmm. out in, like, this farmland area. Like, I, I've barely gotten out of the main, main city. Let me put it to you that way. Like you, you, you got that big main city that they introduce you to, and then you, you go and find one of the twins is battling uh, this wraith or something that turns people into similar style creatures. Mm -hmm. and then, then you go find the other one who's outside of a another what looks like another big type of city that has a bunch of slums around the outside. And that's about as far as I am in there. I'm I'm very still very early game in this, um, mainly because of life matters. Yeah. So I I can't really comment too much on the story at this stage, mm -hmm. mainly because I have I've probably experienced maybe two percent of it. Yeah. But even with even with that, I don't think it'd be out of line for me to say that, um, you've been more inve you've been more invested in the story that th that's been developing. Than you were for the last few expansions of WoW. I don't think I'm out of line saying. Yeah, no, not at all. 
I have paid more. Att- uh, I've started to pay more attention to it now that I'm I'm sort of slowing down because we are starting to get closer to uh, to Endwalker. And I feel that I, I, when I have the time to invest in it, I want to invest my time in it properly and sit there and go through the story as it is meant to be told. Mainly because of the way that the storytelling style in this relies on the game only. I don't have to go and hunt down a bunch of supplementary material in order to understand the lore. If I do get stuck... Well, there's a million lore videos on YouTube that I could watch in order to understand it. There's and it's usually using the actual story itself, not, mm-hmm. again, not supplementary material. Yeah. And with all, with all, that, with all that said, I know that um, that there's been that it's kind, it is kind of funny that in the, in the moments leading up to um, the original release date for Endwalker before we had the delay, and then, and then what I'm about to talk about had a delay. It seemed like WoW was gearing up for um, 9.1.5 Eternity's End, which they, which they're claiming is wrapping up the story that had been that had been building up all the way, all the way since War since Warcraft Three, which again we have that whole piggybacking thing. But do you? But from but do you think that nine point one point five at this juncture is an instance of too little too late? Well and truly. Oh. It is it is, it is the fans have already left and like I said, the those that are sticking around at this particular point in time are huffing copium in great ma- great amounts. Mm-hmm. Uh Blizzard has screwed the pooch completely with um, with Shadowlands to the point where they are going to have to reboot the game to survive. I do. They're, they're, they're possibly looking at having to do like a you know a 1.0 over. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember. Bel- I remember Bellular speculating that the next expansion might be the Dragon Isles. I.e., i.e., that th- that they might try and focus on a return to Azeroth. Um, but after, sort of have but, to, sort of have to at this point. Yeah, especially especially since I think I think um, I think I think a lot of I think people are just beyond sick of the cosmic stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd and I'd I'd actually say the cosmic stuff is far. Is far more alienating than anyone thought Pandaria ever was. L- oh yes, largely because with a lot of the stuff with what well, with the Maw and trying to explore the and trying to explore and redefine the cosmology, it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of these big co- it's a lot of these big concepts and fa- and fancy terminology. But when we when you look at when you look at the parts of stories that we that we get invested into. Um, saving the world is the least interesting part. Correct. <laughs> um, like I'll use I'll use some. Um, even though even though it's a flawed example, I'll use some I'll use something like Halo Four as an example, because I think I think it perfectly illustrates this kind of dichotomy. The saving the world part and st- stopping the didact and all of that, that is far less interesting compared to. Dealing with Cortana's rampancy, and her and the possibility of her dying, and tr- and tr- and trying to hold on to some degree of hope that you'd be a- that you'd be able to stop that process. A personal stake is always going to be bigger than the wider stakes. Mm-hmm. And obviously, it is significantly harder to do this with a MMO. I think I think that where um, fourteen manages to pull this largely off is that the store. In we've talked we talked before about about certain pillar characters that re- that reoccur throughout the story with WoW. Mm-hmm. You kind of have that to the same to the same extent in FF fourteen, but it largely stems around the scions. 
who you are not a leader of, you're just a important member of. Yes. Oh. And because of the fact that that you end up you end up spending a lot of time with those characters and seeing them seeing them evolve with each with each expansion. Um some some more than some more than others, but all but all of them in t- all of them in turn to the point where the way they looked at looked like in A Realm Reborn is very far removed from the way from the way they are now. Like say Thancred would be one example. Mm-hmm. Where he where he was at where he wa- where he was at the start of at the start of the story versus where he is um by the by the time Shadowbringers comes along. A, lo- a lot of that comes from natural development. Mm-hmm. The characters in Final in Final Fantasy fourteen grow and develop with the games. They don't, and they don't just sit on a binary either. It's not they're good or they're evil. These are complex characters with thoughts, feelings, opinions that may not mesh in a single binary construct. Whereas World of Warcraft, you have character is good or character is evil. There's no, you know, no middle ground, no gray. There's no anything. Mm-hmm. And-, and, and also the progression of your character plays a big part in everything as well. When you first come in to... When you first start the game, you are not... You are just called Adventurer. You and and you're not even an adventurer. You're 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 less. You're you know, um, you know. It's like the uh, the uh, Dragon Ball Beach Popo joke. You know, it's like you know. There's there's the amoeba. No, there's Popo. Then there's Popo stool. Then there's the maggots that are in oh. the stool. And then there's, and then there, then there's all the way down. Then you go right down to the bottom, and there's you. Mm-hmm. That's how you start Final Fantasy. You're not even a an actual adventurer, you're a novice adventurer. You are a first-time adventurer. And as you go and you grow and you learn and the characters beside you grow and learn, you go from being an adventurer to being the warrior of light. You have progression, natural progression over time. Whereas World of Warcraft, you have always been some sort of special character. You've you usually are the champion, or in you know modern case, you're the more walker. You're a chosen special one. In the the difference between the two is one is given, the other is earned. Final Fantasy, you're earning. Mm-hmm. World of Warcraft, you are given. And I think that makes a different experience from a play, from a play style, and from a narrative point, and just about every other point that there is. Yeah, and I do think I, I do think that these, and I mentioned this at the tail end as a bit of a capstone for Sunday, that the success of fourteen is going is going to have is going to have a ripple effect when it comes to other projects. Um, chief among them is is putting as, putting aside stuff like the the remaining at the remaining parts of the FF7 remake. Um, I think I think that more that more contemporary style of fantasy that we had that we had been seeing um, dominate since 1997 in one form or another is going to start falling by the wayside. That's not to say it's going to be excised completely, but you're probably going to see a whole lot more that is go- that is going for that um, steampunkish look that we ha- that we have with fourteen. Oh, steampunkish slash Magit- magitech that kind of motif. I know, yeah. like, I know, like to I know people like to say it's going to be more fantasy. Except, any I think anyone who argues that doesn't doesn't really know their history if they if they think that um, there was there was ever a po- there was ever a point where. Um, that were the Final Fantasy series was quote unquote medieval fantasy. It's all maybe like- maybe in the like like Final Fantasy one and two, no. maybe um, Final Fantasy. Uh, I know it's I know it's basically saga, but 
um, the Final Fantasy Adventure games for the Game Boy were very sort of medieval fantasy ish, but they've all but the Final Fantasy games have always had some form of mechanization that is outside of the genre. The key the key thing with um with the kind of with the kind of setting that the franchise has built is that you can't re- you can't really pin it down to one particular genre. You have you have a hodgepodge of d- of different styles that's developed its own identity, which is not too far removed from a lot of a lot of po- a lot of popular culture media in Japan. You have instead of instead of not and not not just bringing up anime, but ju- whether it be anime, whether it be whether it be tokusatsu, whether it be Japanese wrestling. You have the you have this mixing of ide- of ideas into into the into this whole um as oppo- as opposed to as opposed to a more segregated type of type of approach of thi- of this is fantasy this is sf and this is uh this is spy fiction and so on um i'm not saying one is be- is better or worse than the than the other but I'm more, I'm more, I'm more saying that when people, when people think of medieval fantasy, they're thinking Lord of the Rings. That's yeah. a style of fantasy that this series has never strove for, and it no. especially has not stro- strove for that. If you look at any of the concept art that Yoshitaka Amano did over did over the years for the series, like, I yeah. Just, well, uh, unfortunately, like, I retroactively have played, played my way through Final Fantasy games in the past. I'm not judging. Um, I'm not judging on that front. But I, 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 I was, I was one of those those people who started with seven. No, but I have no, gone really? back and I have, I have played the the other ones. Um, six I... particular has a lot of that machination that we oh, see yeah. even coming through in Final Fantasy fourteen. Yeah, even even the original, even the first game had airships. Oh, had airships, and well, time travel is certain is certainly not a concept that you're going to see in in a lo- in a lot of in a lot of medieval fantasy. And we had that we had that in the very fir- we had that in the very first game. Um, and I bring I bring that kind of thing up because when sixteen got announced, everybody was like, "Oh, we're going back to medieval fantasy." I was like, "We've never been to that. We've never been to medieval fantasy. We've been doing a, we've been doing a mix since eighty seven. Oh. If you if you if you if you want medieval fantasy, go play The Witcher. Um, if if some if somebody, I'll be I'll be honest. The people who have a stickler about quote unquote medieval fantasy, they're not think they're not thinking of The Witcher. They're thinking of something far more British. I would probably say I would have gone with Zelda, but sure, that's not British. <laughs> um, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure some I'm pretty sure someone. Someone, if they squinted hard enough, would say that it's Irish, but that is being extremely pedantic. Um, but when it comes to when it comes, come, I bring that kind of thing up because I do, th- like I said, I do think that we're going to see more. We're going to see more of this style um, down the road, um, and that is going to upset certain 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 camps who got their start with with seven and think that's the default. But given all of the allusions to previous games that fourteen has had, I honestly think that's been the best advertisement for people to try out what came before. Yeah. I I could I could see what you're getting at with that. Oh. Because there's because the thing with Final like Final Fantasy fourteen has done a great service to the history of Final Fantasy. There are fights, references, um, all sorts of stuff in which they're paying homage to the past. Like the, the bipedal walkers that you get near the end of uh, A Realm Reborn. Mm-hmm. The first one that, that, that Sid fixes up. Yeah. That's, that's a homage to Six. You know, all of the the titans that you're fighting against have been in the games as summons for as far back as I can remember, even more. Yeah, um, some they're, 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 you know, like we were saying before, Knights of the Round, mm-hmm. the Spell and Seven, 
Yeah, some have been around since three. Yeah. So you, you've got stuff that harkens back to the older games. And, uh, you know, even characters, situations, storylines play back to older games. And if there was anything that is a great advertisement to go and replay the old stuff, it's this. And I do, I do look. I am very much looking forward to to end to um, Endwalker. Um, I am pr I between the two new classes, the one that the one that I'd be more willing to try out is um, the Reaper because I've never been good at healing classes. Mm. I am very much my myself and Xan are very much going to be looking forward to the salt that's going to ensue with the changes that are going to happen to Scholar. Because it means scholars aren't able to be AFK anymore. They're actually going to have to interact and not just have their fairy do all the work. Mm. But i I'd say that I'd say that is that's an effective capstone for that for this particular journey. And well, the. It is going to be interesting to see to see how to see the two to see the two sides in to see how um everything kind of coalesces in the next few months. At the very at the very least, um, it's 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 not it's not going to it's not going to be boring. And I'd say I'd say um you ended up when it came to some of the alternatives you could have gone with, you ended up dodging a bullet because hey, it could have been worse. You could have you could have spent time on New World. <laughs> yeah, I I had friends who have played that, and there's no way no I would have bothered. Yeah, but with that said, I'd like to thank you for um for play, for schedule juggling so that we so that you could do this. Um, and def I'd say it was was definitely worth it. And of course, a sincere thanks always goes out to. The, to the brothers and sisters of the temple who took the time out of their schedule to listen to us ramble on for almost three hours. <laughs> and there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch.